ওইটা একসঙ্গে তো কর ডায়াগনোসিস আর ক্রুশিয়াল ফর দ্যাট Cervical cancer can be cured if caught in the early stage of the disease. The screening can detect the SPV infection, which is the main cause of the cervical cancer and cell changes that may be lead to these cancers. In last year, that is 2020, more than 60,000 women were diagnosed with cervical cancer. And among them, more than 340,000 deaths were due to this deadly disease. And almost 85% of the in cases and almost 90% of the deaths from the cervical cancer occur in the low and middle income countries. Persistent infection with high risk SPV type is the main cause of the disease and 80% of the people will get this type of the infection in their lifetime and which causes six types of the cancer. Among them, cervical cancer is one of them. SPV vaccine can protect against this deadly disease and it can be affected treated if it is treated early in stage of the disease and regular screening can be done such type of disease can be prevented and it is the most preventable because and it is the treatable type of cancer in this the uh, more than 340000 deaths the more than 80% are in the low and middle income countries and the cause of their death is due to the less the access to the screening and to the treatment and so we all have to the so we all have to the access to this and our goal should be in that the first session is is the inaugural sessions and it will be the in, the session of the chairperson of the first session is professor t h sudri sir and our professor t h sudri sir and also the sapo president the professor ki sudri sir sir is the president gynae oncology society of bangladesh and sir is the gynecologist and infertility specialist sir is the past director ipgmr and he has the affiliation in bardem general hospital and ibrahim medical college hospital and sir got the independent day award in medicine in 2017 and another sir persons of two days session is the sapo president that is dr rohana hatatwa and he is the chair committee on the menstrual disorder figo former secretary general asia oceania federation of obstetric and gynecology and he is also the chair of the nine wells care mother and baby hospital colombo sri lanka and moderator of this session is dr farhana kalam and dr dr farhana kalam he is the gynae oncologist from national institute of cancer research and hospital and another the moderator is dr Farhana Hawk, he is also the student in Gynae Oncology in National Institute of Cancer Research and Hospital. The, over to you, the first session will be moderated, Dr. Farhana Hawk. Over to you, Dr. Farhana Hawk, please. Madam, can you see the screen? Yes, yes. Assalamu alaikum. I humbly request Professor uh, T.H. sir to invite Professor Sabera Khatun, madam, for welcome address. Professor T.H. Odhuri, sir, over to you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, it is a pleasure to introduce Professor Sabera Khatun. She actually in Bangladesh, she does not require any introduction in the field of oncology. She was the chairperson of the Department of Oncology in Bangabandhu Medical University. And all along, she has been trying to establish 
concern studies as an academic exercise and has been able to introduce the FC PS course in oncology subspeciality in Bangladesh. She is a very uh, prolific speaker and goes on speaking for almost all the cancer forums and a great advocate for appropriate treatment of cancer patients in this country. So welcome, Professor Sabaraka. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, sir, for your nice introduction about me. Uh, I think you have said more than that, I, which I reserve. Uh, Suffolk Oncology Committee is a committee the committee persons are working uh, wants to do something for the prevention of cervical cancer in the Suffolk countries. And with that aim, the, our first CME program was held in 17th November. And the theme of that CME was the screening of cervical cancer. And that was the celebration of the launching of cervical elimination of cervical cancer. And after three months, and uh, I was given the responsibility to organize the second CME on the treatment of cervical cancer. And that's why the, the today's CME program on the elimination of cervical cancer by 2030, not beyond us. And in this CME, we will talk about the the speakers will talk about the treatment of cervical cancer. And I, well, I uh, am very delighted to uh, welcome Professor T. S. Uthi, sir. He is the past president of Suffolk and the present president of Gynecological Oncology Society of Bangladesh. And Dr. Rohana Hatatwar, he is the president of Suffolk. My heartiest welcome to you, sir. And I also welcome to Dr. Alia Aziz. He, she is the chairperson of the Suffolk Oncology Committee. And Professor Roshan Begum is the past president of OGSB. Now, I would like to welcome the chairpersons of the CME program. And the, in this CME program, there are four scientific sessions. The chairpersons of these sessions are Dr. Bhagulok Kinayak. She is the co-chair of the Suffolk Oncology Committee. And Professor Shirin Akhtar Begum, Professor of Gynecological Oncology Department of Bangunthu Sheikh Mujik Medical University, Dhaka. Professor Rubina Sohili. She also is the past president of Suffolk. And she is also director of Department of Medical Education since Lahore. Another chairperson, Professor Kedosi Begum, she is the present, present president of OGSB and immediate past president of Suffolk. Professor Rokia Anwar, head gynae oncology NICRS, and Dr. Niranjan Sarban, uh, he is the professor and image chief of Sion Hospital India. I welcome you all the chairpersons for this CME session. Our speakers are the Dr. Inaya Abdul Rahim, Dr. Tahira Yasmin, uh, Dr. Jitendra Priya Pariyar, Professor Janatul Feddos, Professor Swed Akram Hussain, Professor Nizamuddin Ahmed, and Prof uh, another. Professor Nizamuddin Ahmed and Ramaya Rai. I welcome you all the speakers in this CME program. Our panelists in this session, in this CME program, are the learned panelists are Dr. Samantha Parman, from, he is from Sri Lanka, Dr. Niranja Sofan, he is from India, and Dr. Agoyan Toshme, and he is from uh, Nepal, Dr. Namkhadurji, he is also from she he is also from Bhutan. Dr. Agan and Namkhadurji, both of them are from Bhutan, and Dr. Kitipal Shibi and Professor Shahana Parvin. 
I welcome you all the learned panelists in this CME session. I re my respective or uh, respectful welcome to you all. And I also would like to welcome to the moderator of this session, Professor uh, Dr. Rifat Ara, Dr. Farhana Kalam. And I want to welcome also Professor Fauzia Hussain, who is the professor of the Ghanaian Oncology Department of Mangamundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. Welcome all the participants and the, all the chairpersons, speakers, moderators, coordinators, all of them. I welcome you all in this session. I respect you all to start the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam, for your nice speech. <clears throat> Now, uh, my humble request uh, to Dr. Rohana Hatutua to call Dr. Alia Aziz to talk on aims and activities of Suffolk Oncology Committee. Dr. Uh, Rohana Hatutua, sir. Thank you for asking me to introduce our own uh, Dr. Alia Aziz, uh, who is the chairperson of our Oncology Committee of Suffolk. And she's very active and she has been organizing so many uh, <coughs> activities during the thought period she has taken office. She's an associate professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, La Khan University Hospital, Karachi, Pakistan. So I would uh, invite uh, Dr. Arya to speak uh, to this. Order. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Professor Rohana, for your kind introduction. Can you all see the slide share? Yes. Yes, we can see. All right. Uh, so um, thank you, Professor Sabra, for arranging this uh, important webinar on the World Cancer Day. Uh, CEFOG Oncology Committee uh, is a very active committee, as Professor Rohana said, and we are working under the guidance of Professor Rohana. Um, I have uh, the co-chair uh, from India, Dr. Bhagya Lakshmi Nayak, and we have representatives, uh, Dr. Niranjan, Dr. Tahirar, Professor oh. Sabira Khatun, Kritipal Subedi, Chintana uh, from Sri Lanka, Inaya, and Dr. Eugene from Bhutan. So we have representatives from uh, almost all CEFA countries, except Afghanistan, which uh, is under the water. Uh, so, uh, cancer burden in CEFA countries is tremendous. Cervical cancer, uh, which is our theme for today's webinar, is the fourth most common cancer in the women worldwide. And in Asia, uh, the highest incidence rate is 58%. And mortality rate is also uh, more than 50%. The challenges faced by CEFA countries are several. Social cultural norms, lack of awareness, stigma associated with cervical cancer, lack of access to healthcare facilities, and of course, lack of funds and resources. So CEFA believes that cervical cancer is a preventable disease with vaccination, screening, and early detection. And uh, based on WHO cervical cancer elimination studies, uh, we have worked on the first two uh, themes in the past webinar, and today we are going to concentrate on uh, this elimination strategy that 90% of women with pre-cancer or cancer should receive the appropriate care and treatment. Uh, the activities which uh, the CEFA Oncology Committee plans is a quarterly webinar. So we have had one and this is our second one. Uh, we also uh, are working on our CEFA Gynecology Oncology Theoretical uh, Virtual Course, which will have eight modules, three hours each. And uh, it will have defined learning objectives and assessment, and this will be certified by CEFOG after com successful completion. So once this uh, course is ready, we are going to launch it after approval from the executive board. We are also uh, planning on skill development programs, for example, radical hysterectomy, uh, one person from each country should be trained, uh, colposcopy training. Uh, escalation of screening programs and the different national programs for non-communicable diseases. And the most important is CEFOG educates HPV vaccine. 
and we uh, are advocating that this vaccine should be included in the national immunization programs of all CEFOG countries. And uh, we are hoping that the country representatives of CEFOG will meet their respective government officials and policy makers to prioritize this initiative. Some CEFOG countries already have this in uh, place, some uh, are still working on it. We are also uh, planning some pre conference oncology workshops in the National Society Symposia. So we have one planned for September, uh, one planned for May this year, and one in the AOFG conference in May this year. So hopefully, uh, all these activities and many more in, by the respective CEFOG representatives are going to uh, make our um, mission or vision accomplished by the end of. Uh, 2030. Thank you all. Thank you, Madam, for your nice speech. Uh, now I request President OGSP and President uh, Safo for opening remarks. Professor T. H. Yodhuri, sir, and uh, Professor Rohana Hatutua, uh, sir, I uh, request both of you for uh, opening remarks. <clears throat> Thank you very much for inviting me to say a few words in this session on oncology committee of SAFO. Now, as you all know, this is the uh, Cancer Awareness Day today, and the theme is to narrow the gap between in, in care between rich and poor. Unfortunately, the gap in case of cancer of the cervix is very wide. You hardly get uh, invasive cancer in rich, well-to-do people, either because they subject themselves to regular screening and whenever any lesion is found that is appropriately treated. On the other hand, the poor who get this infection more commonly has hardly any opportunity to get screened or treated. So gap here is very wide and it is also unfortunate because cancer cervix is a disease which is totally eradicated, it can be totally eradicated. We know the pathology, we know the how the condition can be diagnosed and we also know how effective treatment can be rendered. If even if invasive, they are detected at a early, at a very early stage. So here is definitely a gap in this in the service or care opportunities between the poor and the rich. But that should not deter us. This is a condition which of national importance. And I think every country in this region should take up a program for vaccinating the girl, which is the most effective and robust way of preventing this uh, cancer and also for timely screening as well as improving the facilities for treatment where unfortunately the patients come late. So I think the SAFOG is an organization which can press the respective governments that they should come forward to remove this a dangerous disease where everything is known. Only thing is the lack of initiative resources and also the involvement of the government in this effort. So I think in our country at least we have been doing some progress, but even then I think it's far from satisfactory. It must be upscaled and possibly this applies to many of these countries in this region. The cancer cervix is highly accessible organ which can be screened easily, but there is no reason why the government should not come forward.
vaccination program, some countries, I think Sri Lanka uh, has started it. We also started it, but because of resources, uh, possibly it's not available now. But we are going to start it soon. And lack of resources cannot be an excuse for not providing this service to these women of this country. So I hope the government will come forward and possibly will make more rapid progress in coming years. Even if we cannot reach the target of totally eliminating cancer service by 2030, we can reach near about the goal. So with that optimistic note, I think I end here today. I ask Dr. Rana to make a few more comments. Thank you, Professor Chaudhary. I mean, <clears throat> Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see Professor Chowdhury uh, <coughs> yeah, chairing this session because uh, Professor Chowdhury, who is a past president of Suffolk, he is a very active and he is always uh, very supportive of all our programs. And this, with this valuable advice, uh, we, we, we are able to go forward. So we are very thankful to him, firstly. And then, <coughs> Uh, also, Professor Sabira Khartoum uh, for uh, organizing this uh, webinar in uh, uh, on behalf of our sub uh, oncology committee. Uh, thank you very much for your help and assistance and for everything you just done. Now, Professor Assis, our oncology committee chair, and Bhagya Lakshmi, uh, the co-chair of oncology committee. Both are very, very dynamic personalities who have been very active and uh, involved with so many programs in this uh, during this very short time. So, as uh, uh, so, I would like to congratulate Professor Ali and Bhagya Lakshmi. Uh, it's four o'clock. Organizing this uh, another webinar in a very short time. Uh, this webinar, I suppose, is the continuation of the webinar which was organized by the Oncology Committee along with the WHO, FIGO, A4G, and FOXI to mark the first anniversary of the WHO Cervical Cancer Elimination Day. Uh, and so today, I'm happy that the Bangladesh Society of Oncology is also uh, associated with this program. Safog uh, is committed to the call by the WHO to eradicate cervical cancer by 2030 by an accelerated program. And as was mentioned by uh, the cervical cancer and Dr. Alia also, cervical cancer continues to be a leading cause of uh, leading cause of cancer in these Suffolk countries and contributes to high mortal rates in some of our countries. So in our countries, there are many issues that have to be attended to with regards to screening, HPV vaccination, early detection and treatment. Uh, yes. So we are facing, as Dr. Alia mentioned, so many challenges and obstacles, uh, so which we have to address and, uh, and overcome to achieve our goal. Uh, the though the mortality due to cervical cancer is greater than the maternal mortality, the attention given to the elimination of cervical cancer has been much less up to recent times. So support through the Oncology Committee will work with and assist our, our member countries in the drive to eliminate cervical cancer. So many programs. So uh, as uh, Dr. Alia mentioned, so, so many activities are planned for the future. So with this, uh, I suppose we may be able to uh, help our own member countries uh, to achieve. So as we believe that no woman should die from cervical cancer as it is preventable and could be detected early uh, at a, a very pre-cancer stage and treat. So, so, so it is our responsibility uh, so to, uh, to assist this program and to go ahead. I see that today's program will address the issues of diagnosis, surgical and radiological treatment and uh, the least discussed, but still very important palliative treatment 
is also being discussed today. So that is very important. Uh, this will be discussed by, uh, I see uh, experts <coughs> in the field of oncology participating as speakers and panelists. So once again, I thank uh, the chair and the co-chair of the Suffolk Oncology Committee for their untiring work and for organizing this workshop uh, with uh, the Bangladesh uh, uh, Oncology Committee. And I am very certain that this will be very helpful and educative to all of us. I would like to conclude here that with all the best wishes to a successful webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, okay. for your nice and valuable uh, uh, talk. Uh, our next sessions are all on uh, scientific session. First session is conducted by Dr. Farhana Kalam. I request Dr. Farhana Kalam to conduct the first session. Thank you, Dr. Farhana Hawk. And now it is the time for scientific session. Session one, update in staging and imaging of cervical cancer. I would, <clears throat> I would like to invite the chairpersons of this session, Professor Dr. Bhagalokhi Nayak, ma'am. She is Professor, Department of Gynae Oncology, Regional Cancer Center, Chaptak, and fourth year Suffolk Oncology Committee. And Professor Dr. Shidin Akhtar Begum, Madam. She is Professor, Department of Gynecological Oncology, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Madam, please start the session. And it is handed over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Farana. So with the permission of President Rohana sir and uh, Dr. Chaudhary, I go take ahead the scientific program today. So our first speaker today will be Dr. Inaya. So Inaya is a member of the Safa Oncology Committee from the Maldives. And she has a very, very keen interest in working in the field of preventive oncology, especially the prevention of cervical cancer in uh, Maldives. So she has a lot of work in this field. And today we will be hearing from her about the new staging of cervical cancer. I think the cervical cancer staging has changed a lot for the better of all of us because initially it was basically only all clinical. So now we are allowed to include in that pathological staging, radiological staging. And uh, uh, it is uh, simpler for everyone to follow because you can do whatever investigation is available to you. And especially the nodal staging has now become a very important thing. And I think Inaya will discuss about that uh, very uh, vividly. Uh, so over to Inaya, Dr. Inaya. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Bhagya Lakshmi, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Prof. Sabera and uh, Prof. Rohana and Prof. Chaudhary, Safog and uh, ONG Society of Bangladesh for conducting this CME. I was given the topic of uh, cervical cancer staging, update in the cervical cancer staging. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, madam. Yes. Okay, so um, staging of cervical cancer can um, either be based on uh, TNM classification by American Joint Committee on Cancer on uh, on, can uh, on cancer, or by figure classification. A cervix was the first organ to be assigned a clinical staging system for cancer by figure in 1958. Subsequently, the pathologic TNM classification staging followed, which has been used for the purpose of documenting nodal and metastatic disease status. Until 2018, figure staging for cervical cancer had been based mainly on clinical examination and often primary tumor stage was underestimated and hence uh, uh, treatment was um, maybe under uh, diagnosed. Now, I think uh, now the clinical imaging as well as the pathological has come into the staging. So probably upgrading of the staging will be done. So uh, I have shown in this slide uh, FIGO 2009, uh, 2009 classification. This is the TNM 2020 AGCC classification, which is aligned with the recent 2018 FIGO classification. 
So FIGO doesn't have the uh, carcinoma in C2 anymore. Stage zero is eliminated already. And the revised staging, which is shown here, the horizontal dimension is no longer considered in defining the upper boundary of stage 1A, and it has not been shown to show any impact on survival. Uh, uh, stage one is uh, microscopic, um, and uh, stage one A one, the measured stromal invasion is less than three mm in depth. One A two is measured stromal invasion more than three, less than five mm in depth. And imaging and pathology can be used where available to supplement the clinical findings with respect to tumor size and extent in all stages. Uh, pathological findings supersede imaging and clinical findings. So um, coming to 1B, this is the macroscopic uh, uh, staging. In this, we have 1B1, 1B2, 1B3, which is also aligned with the TNM classification. The 1B3, which was not there in the previous FIGO classifications. 1B3, which uh, it has invasive carcinoma more than four centimeter in greater, greatest dimension. So if the margins of the cone biopsy uh, are positive for invasive cancer, the patient is assigned to stage 1B1. And stage, uh, the, this is the three classifications which is done. The involvement of vascular uh, lymphatic spaces should not change this, should not change the staging and the lateral extension of the lesion is no longer considered. Stage two, um, there is no change in stage two compared to the previous uh, one. Uh, stage two involves involvement of the lesions in the upper two third with or without the parametrial involvement. Two uh, A is uh, without the parametrial involvement in the upper two thirds of the vagina, and two B is with parametrial involvement but not up to the pelvic wall. Coming to uh, stage three. The revised uh, 2018 uh, system includes the nodal status, the presence of nodal involvement in a tumor of any size um, upstages the stage, stage uh, 3C with uh, 3C1 indicating the pelvic and um, 3C2 indicating paraiotic nodal involvement. And micrometastases are included in stage 3C. The revised uh, figure classification is now more closely aligned with the structure of the TNM classification. Uh, example, if, uh, if and, and also with this uh, staging, um, uh, we have imaging and pathological. Uh, if uh, with the notation of uh, R for imaging and P for pathology to indicate uh, the findings that are used to allocate to stage 3C. For example, if an imaging indicates a pelvic uh, lymph node uh, metastasis, the stage allocation would be stage 3C1R. If confirmed by pathological findings, it would be stage 3C1P. And the type of imaging modality or pathology technique used should always be documented. And when in doubt, the lower staging should be assigned. Uh, stage four is, of course, the distance metastasis. 4A is uh, when it is the regional uh, metastasis is there. B is for distance metastasis. Um, FIGO does not mandate any uh, biochemical investigations or investigative procedures. However, in patients with frank invasive carcinoma, chest X-ray, and assessment of uh, hydronephrosis with renal ultrasound, CT or MRI can be done. The bladder and the rectum are evaluated by cystoscopy and sigmoidoscopy only if the patient is clinically symptomatic. And cystoscopy is also recommended in cases of barrel-shaped endocervical growth and in cases where the growth has extended to the anterior vaginal wall. A suspected bladder or rectal involvement should be confirmed by biopsy and histologic evidence. So I've included here the TNM classification, the N regional lymph nodes. In this, uh, N1 is the regional lymph node metastasis to pelvic lymph nodes only, and N2 is the regional lymph node metastasis to periodic lymph nodes with or without positive pelvic lymph nodes. So now this is uh, included in the recent uh, FIGO uh, staging. The, the suffix MI is added to the lymph node metastasis if more than 0.2 mm, but less than 2 mm. If uh, the suffix SN is uh, added to the metastasis, if identify, uh, is identified by sentinel node myopsy. 
And suffix F is added to the N category when metastasis is identified only by FNAC or by cobiopsy. So FIGO and AGCC add the suffix A if the node metastasis is more than two mm in size. Coming to distance metastasis, M0 is no distance metastasis. M1 distance metastasis includes inguinal lymph nodes and intraperitoneal disease. It excludes metastasis to vagina, pelvic serosa, and adnexa. And for clinical metastasis, the prefix C is given, example CM1. And for pathological metastasis, prefix P is given, example e, PM. So what's the difference between the old and the new figure staging? In the old, the stage one, the, horiz the horizontal uh, extension is less than seven mm is included. Now the horizontal extension is no longer considered. Uh, stage one A, in the old, stage one A and one B is there. Now stage one B three is a new stage category that is added that is more than four centimeter in greatest dimension. In the old stage three A, three B is there. Now stage three is newly added with alignment with TNM classification. Now C1 is pelvic Involve, pelvic lymph node involvement, C2 is the parietic lymph, uh, lymph node involvement. Uh, in the old staging, it's based on clinical findings. It does not allow imaging uh, pathology or minimally invasive surgeries. New figure staging allows imaging uh, by, by USG, MRI, CT, PET scans, uh, X-rays, and uh, pathological findings uh, with FNAC or co-biopsies and we, with minimally invasive surgeries can be done via laparoscopy or laparotomy to note the involvement of the lymph nodes and distance metastasis. With that, uh, I come to the end. I hope uh, I have uh, shown the difference between the old and the new uh, FIGO uh, guidelines, staging guidelines. Thank you. Professor Shirin Akhtar Begum, Madam, please invite our second speaker. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Uh, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Farana and I would like to introduce Dr. Tahiri Yasmin. She is consultant of OBGYN, uh, Yakant National Hospital and Medical College, Farachi. And she will talk on update in imaging of cervical cancer. Actually, we all know previously it was said that only clinical examination is enough for uh, staging of cervical cancer. But nowadays, uh, figure staging said that imaging is very much role in clinical staging and management purpose of cervical cancer. So I would like to request Dr. Tahir Yasmin. Please, Dr. Tahir Yasmin. Thank you very much, ma'am. Shiri Akhtar Begum. Uh, hopefully, you all can hear me. Uh, today, I'm going to speak on updates on multimodality imaging for cervical carcinoma. Uh, today, I'm going to describe different features of different imaging modalities for the cervical carcinoma and also the comparison of different modalities that are available. Uh, and explain which imaging modality is uh, superior and why we consider it superior uh, upon the others. So we, as we all know that cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer and it is a long-term complication of PB uh, infection. And uh, it is also second most common cancer in the developing country like ours. And the um, coming to my specific topic, because I have a very short time for this, that the aims of imaging is that we all know that cervical carcinoma, it is treated for early stage uh, disease, we uh, treated by surgery and for the advanced diseases, we treated with con concurrent chemoradiation. So in order to appropriately stage it and to assess the resectability, we need a, a imaging modality on the basis of which we can uh, discriminate between the operable and advanced cervical disease. Secondly, we can also evaluate the tumor response to therapy if patient is subjected to concurrent chemoradiation on the basis of the advanced cervical disease. Similarly, once patient is treated, we follow the patient 
and for detection of the recurrent disease, we also require the imaging modality. So, um, as Dr. Naya said, that previously, the, hopefully, uh, everybody can hear me. Previously, cervical cancer staging was based on the clinical assessment, but now the new FIGO staging system, they have incorporated few things like the tumor size and the lymph node metastasis for which we now do the clinical assessment and also uh, do the radiological assessment on based on it, we stage the patient and then we decide the line of management. So different imaging modalities which we use are basic uh, imaging modality is ultrasound, then CT scan, chest, abdomen, pelvis with contrast, PET scan and MRI pelvis with contrast. These are the four imaging modalities which we commonly use in our clinical practice in case of cervical carcinoma. On the basis of once a patient presents with uh, cervical mass or some history, the basic ultrasound investigation is ultrasound on the basis of which we can see that we can, there can be a hypoechoic hydrogenous mass that is involving the cervix and there may also be increased vascularity on the color Doppler which indicates that there, there are high chances of malignancy there. And if the patient is with the advanced stage disease, hydronephrosis can also be picked up on the ultrasound KUV. We can also assess the size of the tumor, if it is less than 4 centimeter, more than 4 centimeters, parametrial invasion, tumor invasion into vagina, and tumor invasion into the adjacent organs, and we can correlate with the clinical findings. But we all know that resolution of ultrasound is not that good that we, on the basis of just ultrasound, we can stage and we can decide the disease, uh, the line of treatment appropriately, especially in early stage disease when the size of the tumor is very small, then we need some uh, higher imaging modality to appropriately stage it. So the next modality which we commonly use is CT scan uh, pelvis, uh, chest abdomen pelvis with uh, contrast. But because of the poor soft tissue contrast of CT scan, there is limitation for local evaluation of cervical cancer. Local evaluation means the exact size of the tumor, the involvement of the parametrial tissue, and also the, sometimes the vaginal involvement. Because approximately 50% of the cervical cancers, they are isodense to the adjacent stroma and they cannot be delineated on the CT scan. And if sometimes tumor can be seen, it usually appears as ill-defined hypotense, hypotense lesion within the cervix. Another limitation to CT scan is again the low sensitivity for small tumors and overall accuracy for CT scan for cervical carcinoma staging varies between 32 to 80 percent and this wide range is again because for early stage tumors this is not considered as a good modality. However, the advanced stage disease can be appropriately staged and picked up on the CT scan. Uh, similarly, the parametrial invasion is better assessed by the MRI rather than the CT scan. But for lymph node metastasis, the CT scan is considered good. It is a better modality, uh, especially, and a CT scan, uh, the, the CT scan can also be useful in assessing the advanced disease and distant metastasis. So, we perform CT scan in order to assess the lymph adenopathy, pelvic, as well as parioptic, and also in defining the advanced disease, then monitoring the distant metastasis, planning the placement of radiation ports if we have decided on the basis of our imaging and uh, clinical assessment that we have to go, uh, we have to send this patient for uh, concurrent chemo radiation. And if patient requires some biopsy guiding percutaneous biopsy. PET CT. PET CT in conjunction with pelvic MRI is often used as an imaging strategy in helping stage cervical carcinoma. And the good thing is that PET CT can detect the small uh, tumors even less than seven millimeters. One of and the uh, one of the main determinant for planning the treatment in cervical cancer is the distant metastasis or metastatic lymph node. Uh, so PET CT is a better modality for assessment of the metastatic lymph adenopathy. In addition, for staging and treatment line, metastatic lymph adenopathy is also a very important prognostic marker. 
So PET CT is a superior imaging modality or to CT and MRI for detection of the metastatic lymphadenopathy. And the good thing is that it can also pick the small lymph nodes if they are positive with the disease. Now, the next uh, imaging modality is magnetic resonance imaging MRI, which we consider it that it is superior to the other imaging modalities. Therefore, I'm going to discuss in detail that why we consider this as a superior imaging modality for cervical diseases. MRI provides anatomic differentiation and for specifically cervical carcinoma, we inject the 30 ml vaginal gel so that the vagina gets distended and we can have the better assessment of the vaginal involvement and we can also have the better delineation of the tumor in the vagina. And it also helps in the radiation treatment planning. So MRI is considered to be superior to CT and clinical examination in determining the tumor size because as Dr. Inaya said, that now in the new FIGO staging system, less than four centimeter disease is considered as 1B2 and more than four centimeter is 1B3. And the line of the treatment will also change, which our further speakers will discuss. So it is very important to clearly identify our major D tumor size based on the imaging modality. Then local relationship between the tumor and the surrounding tissue is also an important uh, determinant for planning the treatment line, assessment of the tumor volume, and accurately assessing the tumor size. And secondly, the most important thing is that we also need to assess the tumor size once we are this, uh, going for the fertility preservation surgeries because if the tumor size is big, if the uh, tumor is involving the internal os, then we cannot offer the patient for fertility preservation and MRI can clearly identify the internal os involvement. Similarly, with the internal os involvement, there are increased chances, increased risk of lymph node metastasis, and MRI has sensitivity of 90 to 98% in detection of internal OS involvement. There are different protocols, MRI protocols, that are used by the radiologists, like we commonly see, are here from the radiological team, that this is T1 image, T2 weighted image, uh, T1 contrast image, and commonly, and there are different features uh, which are more specific for the radiologist, but commonly our uh, issues are, our queries are more addressed on the T2 weighted contrast images on the basis of which the cervical stroma is as it is uh, appeared as the low signal. And once it is involved by the disease, then hyperintense uh, regions will be noted. So uh, based on the MRI, on T2 weighted images, we can easily assess the tumor size because this, uh, the moderately hyperintense area is clearly separated from the normal cervical stroma and we can assess the tumor size accurately. But again, microinvasive or superficial diseases are hard to detect on MRI if the disease is less than one centimeter in cases of early stage cervical tumor. So for this, we can use the arterial dynamic contrast enhanced MRIs. And in this, even the small foci of the tumor, they become the enhancing lesions that we can pick up on the MRI. So MRI is highly accurate in assessing the tumor size, uh, even within 5 millimeters in 90% of the patients. Then tumor size is an important prognostic factor for early stage cancers. Large tumor sizes are associated with high incidence of extra uterine and nodal involvement. Similarly, for 1B3 uh, diseases, if the tumor size is more than 4 cm, the line of treatment will change to concurrent chemo radiation. Similarly, if the size of tumor is more than 4 cm, we cannot offer the patient fertility sparing surgery. So, the size assessment is important determinant for line of management. So we all can see that this is a large tumor that is the cervical tumor that is seen on the T2 weighted images. And this is showing a bulky cervical mass. And this is also involving the internal os. And pre-treatment MRI has a good precision to indicate the tumor size because with the, after the surgery, 
Obviously, we take out the bulk of the tumor, we cannot assess. Similarly, if patient is subjected to concurrent chemo radiation, the size will regress and we cannot assess the uh, size of the tumor based on the post-treatment. So, pre-treatment MRI has good precision. So, we should always do the baseline imaging before we are taking the patient for any type of the treatment. Secondly, parametrial involvement. This is again, um, this is again going to upstage the disease if there is parametrial involvement. And MRI accuracy for parametrial extension is up to 88% as compared to the clinical examination. Sometimes we can assess the parametrial invasion based on the clinical examination, but sometimes there are queries so we can correlate with the MRI and we can easily state the disease. So the MRI features that are suggestive of parametrial involvement include cervical contour nodularity, irregular borders between tumor and parametrial tissue, presence of soft tissue mass within the parametrium, possibly the periuterine vascular plexus involved will also be there. We can see the, here, again, this is a T2 weighted MRI image and this is showing the final destruction of the parametrial uh, tissue and there is an involvement of the cervical mass into the parametrial. Then comes the vaginal involvement. Clinicians can reliably assess the vaginal uh, uh, involvement by the physical examination uh, and the preservation of low signal intensity on vaginal wall on T2 imaging can reliably ass uh, assess the vaginal integrity. The general invasion cannot be assessed accurately. False positive involvement can be seen because of the exophytic tumor. So, for this purpose, we do the infusion of the uh, injection of the vaginal gel, which will distend the vagina with this gel, and we can easily demarcate. It will easily demarcate the vaginal lining and we can assess that either the two vaginal walls are involved by the tumor or it is just a tumor that is hanging out of the, uh, hanging out in the vagina. Again, this is the T2 weighted central section. Showing the stars, the mass that is involving the interior vaginal wall. Then uh, the next uh, feature is internal loss involvement. It is again a very important and crucial uh, determinant for the planning of the fertility sparing surgery because it is internal loss involvement. We can plan for the fertility sparing surgery based on the this tumor free margin to the internal loss, and it is not accessible on the clinical examination. And the MRI can clearly give us the involvement of the internal loss, and we can plan for the line of management. And it is again a poor prognostic factor for cervical cancer because it is associated with the distant nodal metastasis. And MRI is safe with the high sensitivity of 86 to 91%. Uh, so again, this is showing t 2 weighted imaging. This is showing a large mass that is involving the internal os. Then nodal metastasis. Lymph node metastasis is an important factor, independent uh, prognostic factor for the patient with cervical cancer. And now, as Dr. Inaya said, that the nodal metastasis is also included in the FIGO staging. With the pelvic lymph node involvement, the stage uh, 3B is uh, uh, 3B1. And for the paraortic 3B2 disease stages uh, done, so metastatic lymph node involvement should be clearly identified on the imaging modality before we are planning for the any line of treatment, either surgery or concurrent chemo radiation. Uh, and the size, uh, near the size more than one centimeter is the main cross-sectional imaging criteria for determining the metastatic nodal, uh, metastatic lymph nodes. Micro metastasis cannot be reliably detected even with the fundamental techniques, as I said, dynamic contrast imaging or with any other type of the enhanced uh, MRI techniques, we cannot pick up the micro metastasis. Similarly, MRI cannot discriminate between enlarged inflammatory lymph nodes or the metastatic lymph nodes. Therefore, PET CT scan has highest diagnostic performance for detecting the metastatic lymph nodes in cervical cancer patient, and even it can pick up the nodal mats of less than 5 millimeter. And this is again, this is the T2 weighted MRI 
uh, image which is showing the nodal metastasis, but this is showing because these are the larger lymph nodes. But if for the smaller lymph node, a uh, micrometastasis MRI is not considered as a good modality. Then pelvic valve involvement at the adjacent organ involvement can also be diagnosed or the MRI similarly presence of hydronephrosis, hydrouretin for stage PB can also be uh, picked on the uh, MRI. Local extension of the tumor into the bladder can also be evaluated with, with the MRI. However, for stage four, mucosal invasion of the bladder should be identified when it carries the significant prognosis value. So MRI finding that suggests the bladder invasion are nodular, irregular bladder wall, tumor protruding into the bladder lumen are high signal intensity or to the, of the interior aspect of the posterior wall of the bladder. Similarly, mosaicovaginal fistulas can also be uh, diagnosed on the MRI. Uh, now, this is the large uh, mass, cervical mass that is extending up to the pelvic side wall on the right side. And a heterogeneous mass that is consistent with the peritoneal implant is also seen on the left side of the urinary bladder. This picture is showing the mosaicovaginal fistula in cases of the cervical tumor. Now, distant metastasis, as we all know that cervical cancer can metastasize to lungs, liver, and into the bones. So, we can, for early stage cancers, we can also do the chest x-ray but obviously, chest X-ray can miss the small uh, distant metastasis. So for this, we do perform CT scan chest, and it is CT scan chest is a good predictor of the distant metastasis even in the cervical carcinoma. Similarly, if on MRI or CT scan bony mats are noted, we can pick up on MRI with the good um, uh, specificity. But we can also uh, offer bone scan if the uh, multiple bone metastases are noted. So this is showing the uh, metastasis in the liver and the falsifiable ligament. Better MRI is a new hybrid imaging method and may have the potential of imaging performance rate for detection of small cervical cancer. But yet, uh, more data is needed to establish the clinical implementation of the PET MRI. But this with PET MRI, we can pick up the small cervical cancer disease and even the small size lymph nodes for better um, uh, staging purpose. Now, this is the comparison, whatever I have said, that uh, we can compare the CT scan and MRI finding. And again, this chart is showing that, again, the MRI is a better modality in terms of local invasion of the disease, in terms of uh, pelvic sidewall extension and vaginal involvement. So in conclusion, that clinical staging of cervical cancer cannot be replaced by the cross-sectional imaging for various reasons. But we can, imaging plays a major role in treatment planning as, and also in the, as a prognostic indicator in the patient with cervical cancer. And with the new FIGO staging, we require the imaging modalities to appropriately stage and to decide for the line of the uh, treatment because as we all know that the first treatment is going to decide the prognosis of the cervical cancer even at any stage. MRI and PET-CT have complementary roles and MRI is essential for staging of the primary tumor. PET-CT is the most useful modality for detecting the regional nodal metastasis. Uh, and now PET-MRI yet needs more uh, research for it. Thank you very much. If anybody have any question. Okay, we are at the end of the session. Thanks to the chairpersons and speakers of this session for a very informative presentation. Now I hand it over to Dr. Farana Hawk to conduct the next session. Thank you, Dr. Farhana Kalam. Uh, our uh, second session on surgical treatment of cervical cancer. These patients are chaired by Professor Rubina Soel, Professor of Obstetric and Gynecology, Director, Department of Medical Education, SIMS Lahore, Immediate Vice President, Safok. 
And uh, uh, another uh, chairperson is uh, our respected Professor Fedosi Bego, Madam. She is current president OGSB and immediate past president South Asian Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Now I uh, request our respected chairperson to conduct this session. Now first I uh, request Professor Rubina Soel, Madam, to call our first speaker, Dr. Jitendra Ferreira. Thank you very much. A very good afternoon, everyone. And it is great to have uh, the senior people sitting over here and seeing the staff uh, being represented very adequately. Our first speaker is Dr. Jitendra Pariyar. Dr. Jitendra Pariyar is a professor and specialist of obstetrics and gynecology, and he's a gynecological oncologist who's working in Civil Services Hospital in Nepal. Uh, Dr. Jitendra is going to talk about an important topic and uh, um, his talk is going to entail, just give me a second because I don't have the topic uh, right away with me. Um, just give me a second, please, if you could. So I would like to request Dr. Jitendra to please uh, start his presentation. Dr. Jitendra? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chairpersons. Uh, thank you for uh, the kind introduction. And I bring greetings from Nepal. Uh, and I'm here to talk on diagnosis and treatment of microinvasive cervical cancer. Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. please make it slide show. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> So as we gather today for observing World Cancer Day with the theme, as mentioned earlier by our seniors, close the uh, care gap. Every, everyone deserves access to cancer care. It's true. And that holds true for cervical cancer as well. And as uh, mentioned earlier, like in many cancers and especially cervical cancer, there is gross inequities. And th that is evident by this uh, alarming figure, which states that around 85% of cervical cancer cases are from uh, low uh, middle income countries like South Asian countries and African countries. And that rate is also very high. And it's very sad to know that uh, our cervical cancer screening coverage, population-based coverage is uh, very low. Like in South Asia, Bhutan has done fairly good, but many countries like Nepal, India, Bangladesh, I think we need to do a lot. And talking about cervical cancer, we know that the cause of course is human papilloma virus. And it is associated with uh, sexual act activities, and uh, sexual practices, which are the other additional risk factors. Cervical cancer, squamous cell, uh, squamous cell carcinoma is the commonest uh, histopathological uh, entity, uh, contributing to around 70 to 80 percent, adenocarcinoma being another one, and others like uh, adenosquamous glassy cell and others. Diagnosis of cervical cancer should be pretty easy because we have had this screening test for almost more than 100 years. And uh, cervical biopsy is a very simple procedure. And as mentioned earlier, cervix is a visible uh, part of uh, uterus, uh, visible to naked eye. So any lesion uh, should be accessible for cervical biopsy, which gives us the diagnosis of cervical cancer. But when it comes to good screening uh, programs, like uh, even in uh, not visible, like uh, apparently healthy cervix, abnormal uh, PAP report or liquid-based cytology report may be uh, reported. And uh, for that, uh, those cases, colposcopic gu guided biopsy can give us uh, more accurate diagnosis. And uh, when it comes to larger lesion, uh, cervical, 
colonization and uh, leap procedure should also give us the um, confirmed diagnosis. So uh, cervical cancer can should easily be diagnosed by cervical biopsy. Cervical cancer spreads locally around cervix and vagina and parametrium. And of course, lymph, lymph node uh, metastasis is there uh, around pelvic uh, lymph nodes, aortic, uh, before going to distant ones. And in hematogenous uh, spread, uh, like spread to other viscera like uh, liver, lungs, even brain, both bones have been noted. Cervical cancer in early stages can often be elusive because most of them, early stages, and especially microinvasive cervical cancer, uh, may not have symptoms. And uh, the common symptoms, like vaginal discharge, could be misinterpreted for other in infective pathologies. But when it comes to abnormal uh, uterine bleeding in the form of postcoital bleeding, intermens bleeding, and postmenopausal bleeding, these uh, should be taken as warning signs in early stage disease. And in our part of the world, we do have late stage presentation with pain and uh, bowel and bladder complaints. Cervical cancer staging, um, we follow FIGO staging. As mentioned earlier, uh, it was basically clinical staging. And for resource uh, limited setting like ours, this was a very uh, practical uh, kind of uh, staging for us. But now, since 2018, radiological and uh, pathological findings have also been incorporated uh, in FIGO staging. And as shown in this uh, busy slide, uh, my topic focuses more on pre, uh, like uh, microinvasive cancer, which in fact has stromal invasion of less than three millimeter, stage one A1, and stage one A2, less than five millimeter of stromal invasion. And uh, FIGO staging is done at the time of uh, primary diagnosis. And this staging remains the same throughout treatment and even in recurrent say, setting. It does not get altered. So uh, primary evaluation is very important for appropriate staging. Now, talking about uh, microinvasive cervical cancer, where invasion by the cancerous cells are is less than uh, five millimeter, three less than three or less than five millimeter, and this entity, in fact, is between pre-invasive uh, pathology and frank invasive cancer, and this was initially uh, described by Mestward from uh, Germany. Uh, who ha had done extensive work uh, with colposcopy and application of uh, lugal iodine in apparently healthy cervix uh, for screening. And this entity is very important for us because it does carry good prognosis with even with less radical treatment because uh, the pathology is a focal one with less of uh, lymph node metastasis. So less radical treatment, of course, means less of morbidity and mortality. And treatment could be uh, possible and feasible in even in a resource uh, limited setting like ours. But for microinvasive cervical cancer, pathology reporting is very crucial because uh, uh, we require dedicated pathologies for uh, description of the dimension of the lesion, lymphovascular space invasion, which directs our treatment. And of course, this entity can be caught up early by good and effective screening program. And as shown here, there is 
there has been evolution for almost uh, 70 years uh, around this uh, microinvasive cervical can cancer entity. Limb node metastasis in cervical cancer is uh, pretty common, commonly reported, and uh, it's one of the most important prognostic factor. However, when it comes to microinvasive cervical cancer, lymph node metastasis is very less. Like in stage 1A1 disease, less than 1%, and 1A2 disease, less than 5%. And uh, it has been noted that size of the tumor or the tumor volume correlates with uh, lymph node metastasis. And uh, lymph node metastasis can be caught up by dedicated ultrasound of uh, abdomen pelvis, CT scan, or even MRI. And PET scan is, of course, very useful. So with this additional information, uh, there has been revision in FIGO staging 2018, which has incorporated radiological finding. And when it comes to lymph node assessment, of course, Gold standard is the surgical staging, that is pathology, uh, giving us the diagnosis of whether lymph node involvement is there or not. Another issue uh, when talking about treatment of uh, cervical cancer, because radi radical uh, surgery means extent of parametrium that is uh, removed, but it is noted that parametrial invasion in uh, my, microinvasive cervical cancer is very rare. And that, that is also true for early stage disease as uh, reported in a large scale review by uh, Professor uh, Kathleen uh, Smeller from USA. Like uh, they reviewed almost 1100 cases uh, of uh, early stage cervical cancer. And it was noted that only less than 1% of them had uh, parametrial invasion. So uh, their conclusion was that, uh, could uh, less radical treatment be offered to these early stage disease or microinvasive disease? Uh, again, Professor Kathleen has uh, uh, reported uh, another uh, finding from their study, con conserved study, which was a prospective trial of conservative surgery being offered for early stage uh, disease. And it was noted that recurrence rate was very less, around 3.5%. Uh, and uh, the lymph node metastasis was also noted to be very less, around 5% only. So they, they came to a conclusion uh, and uh, uh, saying that could uh, less radical uh, or could conservative surgery be offered to early stage disease or even my, microinvasive cervical cancer? With these findings, we can outline the treatment uh, for microinvasive cervical cancer as fertility sparing uh, modality like uh, conization, but it should be made clear that the margin should be negative and preferably there should not be lymphovascular space invasion. And for those who do not require fertility uh, or fertility is not an issue, simple hysterectomy in the form of extrafacial hysterectomy can be offered. And for early stage disease, radical trachelectomy for those requiring fertility sparing can be offered. And for those uh, with uh, lymphovascular space invasion who may carry greater risk of lymph node metastasis, radical hysterectomy with uh, pelvic lymph node dissection should be offered. And for those who are not fit for surgery or there is contraindication for surgical treatment, chemo radiation uh, should be offered. And that is the standard treatment. Regarding fertility sparing uh, treatment for uh, microinvasive and early stage uh, cervical cancer, um, 
trachelectomy happens to be one of the preferred one, which was introduced by Daniel Dazan. He's from France, and he reported his uh, series back in 1994. Whenever a new surgical approach is uh, uh, introduced, we should make sure that the, out, uh, the oncological outcome are equally good. And uh, the morbidity and mortality issues should be negligible or less. And when it comes to fertility, of course, uh, take home baby or live birth rate is the benchmark. And for surgery of uh, microinvasive cervical cancer, uh, could extrafacial hysterectomy or simple hysterectomy be a safer, better option? Because we know that uh, radical hysterectomy, which excises the parametrium, is often associated with uh, ureteric injury, bowel and bladder complications, hemorrhagic complications, and uh, both immediate and long-term complications are there. So for microinvasive with the, the uh, presented evidences for microinvasive cervical cancer, could less radical treatment, simple hysterectomy be adequate? Now talking about uh, follow-up, follow-up should be done for those cases like physical examination, cytology, and imaging studies to be done every three, three monthly for at least two years, first two years, and six monthly for next three years. And it is recommended that we follow at least for next 10 years. Cervical cancer uh, outcomes is truly rewarding if we catch our cases in early stage or in stage of micro-invasive uh, stage, like uh, five-year survival is as high as 90, 95% or even more. So we can come to a conclusion and consensus saying that cervical cancer is potentially curable uh, if detected early and treated properly. And for this, and for a microinvasive cervical cancer, we, we do need to uh, strengthen our screening program. So with this conclusion, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Thank you, thank you for your patience sharing. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jitendra. I think it was an excellent presentation highlighting the importance of detecting cervical cancer as early as possible and using intervention in terms of uh, surgical intervention to treat cervical cancer. A very good talk and thank you very much for this. Uh, our next speaker is a very senior gynecologist, Professor Savera Khatun. Uh, she is going to talk about radical hysterectomy step by step. She is currently the Secretary General of uh, 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 GOSB. She is member staff of Oncology Committee. She is the founder chairman, Department of Gynecological Oncology, uh, Bigal Khan, <laughs> Sheikh Mujib Medical University. So I request Dr. Sabera to please start her presentation on radical hysterectomy. Thank you. <coughs> Professor Rubina Sohili for nice introduction about me. Uh, radical hysterectomy for carcinoma cervix, step by step. And in this presentation, in this presentation, uh, I will directly show the steps of radical hysterectomy without going for any. Uh, uh, evaluation or any evidence based any document. I'll go straight forward to step by step radical hysterectomy. Now, why the radical hysterectomy? Because earliest and commonest mode of spread of cervical cancer is local spread, and surroundings need to be removed during surgery procedure. And this is done by 
radical hysterectomy then only be done by radical hysterectomy now whether all the stages can be treated by radical hysterectomy when everybody know that the cervical cancer needs treatment by surgery by radical hysterectomy it's the big question whether all the stages can be treated by radical hysterectomy or whether all the stages stages needs radical hysterectomy answer is no now what are the stages for radical hysterectomy now only the stage on into that is the tumor infection it is on a micro infection that is tumor infection is only 3 to 5 mm and other invasive diseases these three can be by surgical procedure that is radical hysterectomy you can see that the, the growth of the tumor when the growth of the tumor is centimeter or less then only radical hysterectomy when the tumor size is more than 4 cm the radical hysterectomy is not appropriate because result is not good and uh, most of the time doing radical hysterectomy in the presence of the tumor more than 4 cm in size often it is incomplete types of radical hysterectomy is very important there are three types of radical hysterectomy that is modified radical hysterectomy or type 2 radical hysterectomy type 2 hysterectomy or class b hysterectomy or part b hysterectomy all four names are for the same procedure and this procedure was originally described by arnest fardim in 1898 november 16 and this is on this procedure now it is used and appropriate only for the stage on a two disease that is micro invasion radical radical hysterectomy or three hysterectomy or class three hysterectomy universally rec recommended for the, the stages of is on b1 b2 and is to a1 disease and it was originally described by mix in 1924 most of the cases are treated by three radical hysterectomy now it is and another radical hysterectomy is extended radical hysterectomy or type 4 hysterectomy it is appropriate only for the small central central rectus after radiation therapy this hysterectomy only these two hysterectomies are used mostly uh, this one number 2 and number three, extended radical hysterectomy now it is is rarely used because of the very improvement in improvement in the radiation therapy for the patients now this is has been seen by dr jitendra how far radical for the operable cases how far radical that is this is the extra extra partial hysterectomy and this is the type 2 radical hysterectomy only for the um, uh, macro infusion to, to 5 mm and this is the type 3 radical hysterectomy that is most of the cases need this type of radical hysterectomy now additional procedure only radical hysterectomy is not treatment for cervical cancer because um, uh, mode of uh, extension of the cervical cancer is lymph node and uh, uh, most of the in operable cases and uh, to 30% cases are lymph nodes are positive histologically so the likely to be metastasized that is the tissue which are likely to be metastasized should be removed during radical hysterectomy and this is done by bilateral pelvic lymph node dissection and sometimes bilateral sometimes most of the time bilateral sphingophorectomy is done because most of the patients are more than 40 years of age but one ovary in young patients one ovary can be preserved in young women and in that case additional procedure is required that is uh, transposition of the ovary now active stages of radical hysterectomy Pre operative there are some tasks which should be done pre operatively before going for actual steps of radical hysterectomy that is confirmation of the histopathological diagnosis and stage of the disease this is mandatory these two 
these are mandatory before going for radical hysterectomy. And any cervical cancer which is suspicious by inspection must be confirmed by histopathological diagnosis before any surgery. Now, counseling is important part because it is long-term treatment, surgery, radiotherapy, then chemical current chemotherapy. So all the procedures should be counseled with the patient and the family of the members. Action of anemia, diabetes, hypertension, and any other comorbidities should be corrected. Prophylactic antibiotics use prophylactic antibiotics to prevent infection because most of the growths are infected and pelvis is infected in this in our socioeconomic condition. And as well as by giving antibiotic prevention of infection gives an easy resection of the diametrical tissue. Now technique, root, which root use. Nowadays the Laparoscopic radical hysterectomy is not recommended because long term, long term, well, long -term evidence so meta-analysis shows that the result of laparoscopic radical hysterectomy is not good. And now the radical hysterectomy is recommended by laparotomy. Now, incision, which incision will be? Now, the incision commonly used. Incision is the low transfer smellard incision or muscle cutting incision. <coughs> Commonly use low transfer smellard incision or muscle cutting incision. Excellent exposure. This incision is excellent exposure for pelvic tumor or pelvic sidewall uh, exposure and commonly required for early stage. And this is the muscle cutting low transfer incision. Another muscle cutting incision uh, is charnage incision uh, when the muscle is not cut, but the muscle attachment to the attachment of muscle to the pubic symphysis is detached. Uh, another incision can be used. Now midline incision extending above the umbilicus can be used, which give uh, better exposure to the parotid lymph node if required. But most of the time, early stage cancer does not require any midline incision. Now, second stage step of radical hysterectomy is exploration of the abdominal cavity. All organs should be systematically palpated for any evidences of metastasis, and any suspicion or large lymph nodes collected sent for frozen section. If the frozen section is positive, then the procedure, radical hysterectomy procedure is postponed and, and uh, for radica, uh, rad radiotherapy, concurrent chemoradiotherapy. Now, the third step of the, the radical hysterectomy is separation of abdominal organs from the pelvic organs by soaked mop and fish mouth. And this is the procedure by which the, all the pelvic organs are separated from the, all the abdominal organs are separated from the pelvic organs, and the whole of the pelvis is exposed by the mops, sock mops, and the fish mops. Because better exposure can give the better clearance of the tissue. The fourth step is assessment of operability. It's very important and the initial step of radical hysterectomy. And this is done by holding the, uh, holding the uterus by long straight artery for sip and moving the uterus into a posterior and from side to side, whether the uterus is fixed or not. And another step of another step of assessment of operability is by Patient of the surgeries, secretor and pouch, metricator and peritoneum, cardinal ligaments, and base of the bladder. All the surgeries, secretor and peritoneum, cardinal ligaments, and base of the bladder, pouch of Douglas also should be palpated. And this is done by in, introducing two fingers in, in front, side, and behind. Sixth step of Radical hysterectomy is clumping, cutting, ligation, and holding the round ligament. <coughs> and uterus and round ligament infraction. Retroperitoneal space is entered by cutting the anteroposterior layer of the broad ligament from the stump of the round ligament. Now, why 
exposing the retroperitoneal space, we can see the ureter at the pelvic brim. The ureter can be identified at the pelvic brim, and the ureter is dissected up to five centimeters at this stage of radical history. And the pelvic wall, side wall, paraphysic and pararectal spaces are identified. This is the pelvic side wall spaces. This is pelvic side wall, and this is the spaces. <coughs> this, is space. this is the same space which is divided by the cardinal ligament and the uterine artery. Posteriorly is the pararectal space, and anteriorly is the paraphysical space. Which is best based? better exposure for removal of the lymph nodes. Each state of the lymph adenectomy, uh, pelvic lymph nodes are removed in swing method that is starting from the external iliac lymph node up to the mid common iliac lymph node, then internal iliac lymph node, and then occipital lymph nodes. All fatty tissues are stripped from the vessel, vessels. An optical fossa is entered by retracting the vessel that is external like uh, vein and artery laterally or medially. Optical, in this step of uh, hysterectomy, that is in this step of lymphadenectomy, great care should be given to the optical nerve and the accessory optical vessel, which is present in only in 30% of the cases. You can see that the <coughs> You can see that the optical nerve and optical, the accessory of the vessel is present sometimes in 30 percent cases of accessory of the vessel. Vein is present below the optical external um, idea vein. And that gives, uh, if this is not secured during the removal of the optical lymph nodes, that can give severe type of bleeding. So accessory of the vein should be identified first. And if this is present, that should can be ligated, then we can remove the optical lymph nodes. And this is the optical nerve, this should be exposed first, then the internal iliac lymph nodes should be removed. This is another picture of optical nerve, ureter, and spaces. Ninth step is the bladder down dissection. That is, bladder is dissected down by cutting the basic uterine fold of peritoneum. Here you can see that by cutting the basic uterine pouch of basic uterine peritoneum, bladder base is easily identified. And this is taken down by dissection. And care should be taken not to injure the bladder and the side wall. There is insertion of the ureter. In this side wall. So bladder should be dissected first and taken down up to the vaginal wall, entry vaginal wall, before going for any clamping and cut. And this should be done, bladder down dissection should be done before ligation of the uterine artery because sometimes the base of the bladder is base of the bladder is infiltrated and that cannot be identified without cystoscopic assessment. So if there is any uh, involvement of the bladder base, in that case, it, is, it will not be possible to dissect down the bladder and the exposure of the vaginal wall. So that it is not possible to remove the upper vagina. So before the, uh, like the uterine artery, we should take down the bladder. And if the bladder base is involved and it is not possible to take down the bladder wall, bladder base, in that case, the procedure should be postponed in favor of radiotherapy. Now, the next step of your uh, radical hysterectomy is ligation of the uterine artery. As ligation of the uterine artery should be done as near its origin from the superior vesicle artery as possible in type C or type 3 hysterectomy. And, but at its uh, uh, uterine artery is it's crossing by the ureter in type B or class 2 hysterectomy. And internet mobilized over the ureter by gentle traction and dissection. Superficial uterine vein must be identified and cut or ligated. Otherwise, there will be severe hemorrhage. Without identifying the superficial uterine vein, the 
it, we cannot dissect the cardinal ligament. So superficial uterine pain must be identified and clipped or like it, like it before going for uh, dissection of the cardinal ligament. Dissection of the ureter. Ureter needs further dissection from the by mobilizing the peritoneal from the side. And, and nothing was happening. Obviously, after the deliver, even if they had eclampsia, 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 e
prolapse of the part of the vaginal vault prolapse, uh, we can suture the stump of the paravaginal tissue to the vaginal vault. And it is not necessary to do in every case. Now, next phase almost is in the next step, we have to irrigate the peritoneal cavity with warm normal saline. It is mandatory to irrigate the peritoneal cavity at the end of the, any operative procedure done for the malignancy cancer. So, irrigation is important for after the radical hysterectomy. We should do always, and dental should be kept always because every chance of interperitoneal hemorrhage and after uh, post operative interperitoneal hemorrhage, any slipping of ligation, slipping of the clip may cause a profuse interperitoneal hemorrhage. So, to diagnose early diagnosis of this interperitoneal hemorrhage, we should keep drain tube always. Eight stage abdomen is closed in three layers or in mass. Now, these are the classic states of radical hysterectomy. There may be some variation. As for example, the lymphadenectomy can be done first, then hysterectomy next. We, are, we in Bangladesh usually do lymphadenectomy first, then we do the hysterectomy. Because after, in my opinion, the lymphadenectomy gives a more exposure to the pelvic side wall. So we do lymphadenectomy first, then we do the hysterectomy. And so every operator for radical hysterectomy should follow the sick rules as far as possible to avoid the incomplete surgery because incomplete surgery means incomplete treatment for cervical cancer. So our aim should be to give the complete treatment to the patient, not incomplete treatment. Always we should be very careful. We should be determined to give the complete treatment to the patient, cancer patient to give the greater results of the treatment of cancer. Thank you very much for your patience, Yari. Thank you, Dr. Savera, uh, for a very detailed uh, presentation on the steps of radical hysterectomy. I am so happy that there are advances in cervical cancer, and as we are diagnosing cervical cancer early, we should not need uh, radical hysterectomy in our patients. However, it is such an important um, uh, procedure that uh, the newer residents, I think, would like to know the precise steps of the procedure. And that is why your presentation was very important. You made a very important point, and that important point was regarding the completeness of the procedure in the primary treatment. So I think that I would like to give this message from your talk that it is very important to give to do a complete surgical removal of the malignant mass. So thank you very much for this. Our next speaker is Professor yes, Jan. Uh, can Kudor. I have interruption? Uh, uh, Rubina, can I have an interruption? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma one, one of our presenter, Professor Akram Hoshin, she has yes. a TV live presentation. So she needs to present her presentation in this stage. Professor so what Sorry. about Professor Janatul Firdos? She'll go to the next session? Yes, yes. She okay. can go in the next session. Professor okay. Akram Hussein. Okay, so I'd like to invite Professor Sayed so, Akram Hussein, who's going to talk about the current stages of radiotherapy for cancer of the cervix in the SAFOC countries. So you have about 10 minutes for your presentation. Please make it full screen. Uh, yeah. yeah. Can, Thank you. can you listen to me? I'm audible. Am I yes, audible? you are. Okay. Yes, you are. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Give me the opportunity. Thank you so much, Safok uh, and uh, and the GOSP and Professor Pichudir and the Honorable Chair. Uh, my presentation is the current status of radiotherapy for the carcinoma cervix in Suffolk countries. I try to finish in a faster way. We know the cancer burden is very high actually throughout the world in, in 2020 is a 19.2 million. And particularly in our region, it is increasing 46.6% rate in the cancer by 2020, 2040 in this region. Cancer in uh, low income countries actually increasing over the time and particularly 
25% of women are reproductive that die in the cervical cancer from the low resource countries. And Bangladesh situation is also not good. 11.6 uh, in incidence is standardized uh, is incidence and mortality is 8.1 per 100,000 women respectively. So death is also in Bangladesh also almost half. So we know that actually the total treatment depends on uh, it de uh, on radiotherapy and it, the outcome of that depends on the prognosis of this depends on the stage in all status tuber volume depth of cervical stromal invasion uh, lymphovascular space invasion hysterical type and etc so strategy is simple actually we know the surgery and the pelvic radiotherapy concurrent chemo radiotherapy and systemic chemotherapy and bracket therapy actually uh, so this will play a very great role for increasing the survival of the patients so just is keeping the, actually we actually in our countries actually also doing the 3d crt planning in our country also in many centers we have this actually 3d crt and imt also we are doing here in the so this actually and at the same time the bracket therapy we are doing the bracket therapy bracket therapy is increasing actually overall survival is very very important so chemo radiation therapy we are doing in our country the distribution of the mega voltage units actually in this region actually comparatively lower particularly in whole asia so there are the only 4,400 megavolts machines in the lower uh, and LMIC and less than 35% of the world's RT facility. There is shortage of the over 5,000 megavolts machines. But it is recommended that the radiotherapy machine should treat on average up to 500 patients per year. And International Atomic Energy Agency recommended basic RT center starts treatment with the one megavolts machine and one is the brachytherapy. So there is actually disparity. If you find the disparity between distribution of the bracket therapy equipments and the incidence of cervical cancer in different country, particularly in South Asia, is particularly is uh, disparity is very high. So in our country situation is actually we need to we have 160 million population provides the RT coverage only 12.9 percent in this region. This we need actually 320 teletherapy machine and 160 bracket therapy machine to meet these requirements. But we have presently 25 teletherapy machines, six bracket therapies, seven simulators. So the situation is also not really good. But the mostly the public private sectors are having the private sectors are coming faster. So situation overall, so these are the huge challenges for us. So most LMSC have been one machine for the five, five million population or above. So it is centered on most LMS are the overcrowded. Accessibility to the radiotherapy is another challenge. Uh, affordability is also an issue. Other challenging is stable radiotherapy center selection, procurement process, procedures. So finally, as procuring a machine is fruitless without the proper standard understanding of its utilization as sufficient workforce to operate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you. Thank you so much. This is my end of my presentation. Hello. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, uh, it was an excellent presentation and I'm so glad that you made it in time. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Akram, for doing that. I think uh, because we are running short of time and we are just about in time to conclude the session, I would like to conclude the session by thanking our three speakers who made uh, great contributions today by making uh, very clear and focus presentations which will be of help to the viewers in trying to improve the work that they are doing. So with this, I will declare this session closed and invite the organizers for the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam. Thanks and respect to our chairpersons and uh, speakers. Our uh, next session is conducted by Dr. Farhana Kalam. I request Dr. Farhana Kalam to conduct this session. Over to you, Dr. Farhana Kalam. Thank you, Dr. Farhana Hawk. Now it is the time for session three. In this session, Farhana. our chair. Yes, madam. In this session, first speaker will be Professor Jannatul Kedjus. Okay, madam. Yes. In this session, our chairpersons are Professor Rokia Begum, madam, and Professor Dr. Niranjan Chavan.
Professor Roke Anwar, Professor and Head Gyni Oncology, NICRH, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Dr. Niranjan Jaban, Professor and Unit Chief, LTMMC and LTMGH, Sion Hospital, India. Sir and Madam, over to you to conduct the session. Roke, Madam, please invite our speaker. Professor Janatu Fedos, Madam. And uh, very good evening to you all. Um, our first speaker is Professor Janatul Freddos. She is very hardworking and running a gyno oncology unit at BSMMU, Professor Department of Gynecological Oncology. She has many works with many publications nationally and internationally. So at first, I'd like to invite Professor Janatul Freddos Junaki to speak her speech. Please unmute. Thank you so much, uh, respected chairpersons, for your kind introductions. Um, respected chairpersons, my respected teachers and learned audience, um, at the outset, I, uh, good evening and uh, assalamu alaikum. And at the outset, I'd like to give thanks to the organizer for giving me the chance um, uh, to present in this uh, prestigious session. Uh, especially in the World Cancer Day, when we are trying to close the care gap. So can you see my slide? Yes, madam. Okay, welcome all of you to my presentation on XYZ of radical trachelectomy. About 40% of patients with uh, stage one cervical cancer are diagnosed less than 40 years who may need fertility sparing surgery. Trachelectomy is one of the procedure for fertility preservation, and it is applicable in selected younger women with early stage cervical cancer. Now, good selection of patient is crucial for radical trachelectomy. The criteria are, there should be a strong desire to preserve fertility, FIGO stage 1A1 with LVSI 1A2 or uh, 1B1, squamous cell or adenocarcinoma histology, no evidence of spread to parametrium corpus, or upper endocervical canal, no deep stromal invasion, no metastasis to regional lymph node, and no previous evidence of infertility. Patients with neuroendocrine, papillary serous variety, or sarcoma are not candidates for radical trachelectomy. Now, regarding the age limit for trachelectomy, Pariser et al. found the mean age of the youngest patient was 27.6 years, and the oldest one was 33 years while Abu Rustam et al. mentioned the age 40 or less than 40 years. Is it justified to do trachelectomy? The answer is yes, because cancer recurrence and mortality are similar when compared to standard treatment. Now, regarding the pre-treatment evaluation, a critical issue is for the extent of tumor, which can be done by extra chest in addition Pelvic MRI is pre preferred to determine tumor diameter, to exclude involvement in the parametrium, vagina, and corpus, to assess cervical stromal invasion and proximity of tumor to internal cervical os, and to exclude lymphadenopathy. Ultrasound can be done if MRI is unavailable, and PET scan of whole body or CT scan to exclude distant metastasis. Some investigators also suggest to do colposcopy before radical trachelectomy in assessing spread to the vagina. The, regarding interoperative consultation, frozen section has a crucial role to evaluate the pelvic lymph nodes for metastasis and to evaluate the resection margin after trachelectomy. At least five millimeter disease free tissue from resection margin should be there. But frozen biopsy has some limitations in detecting micrometastasis. So in certain centers, it has been replaced by detection of sentinel lymph node biopsy, though in one third of patients with negative sentinel nodes, micrometastasis on final pathology may be found. 
Now, what, uh, regarding the approach to trachelectomy, it can be done vaginally or abdominally through laparotomy technique, laparoscopic technique, or robotic technique. And pelvic lymphadenectomy can be done laparoscopically or robotically or laparoscopic approach. Several studies have shown that both vaginal and abdominal radical trachelectomies have comparable outcomes, and both are safe surgical procedures. Regarding the types of trachelectomy, there are, there, it could be simple a trachelectomy for stage 1A1, no LVSI, and no nodal disease, radical trachelectomy, and trachelectomy can be done even after giving new adjuvant chemotherapy for larger stage 1B cancer. But downstaging of tumors by any CT is still an experimental procedure to verify its oncologic safety. Now, the history of development of radical trachelectomy, laparoscopically assisted radical vaginal trachelectomy, was developed first by Daniel Dargent in 1987. Later on, he reported it in 1994. It was actually a modification of the laparoscopic assisted radical vaginal hysterectomy. Since this report, over 1,000 women have undergone this procedure with more than 250 successful pregnancies afterward, and this was updated in MedScap in December 2020. Radical trachelectomy, also known as Dargent operation. The principle of surgery is the first step is to do pelvic lymphadenectomy to assess the metastasis by frozen biopsy. If it is negative, then the second step will be proceeded. The second step is removing the cervix, the upper part of vagina, and surrounding supporting tissues. The structures removed in radical trachelectomy are majority of the cervix, part of parametria and paracolpos, part of uterus sacral ligament, one to two centimeter of vagina, ligation of descending cervicovaginal branch of uterine artery, or in abdominal approach uterine artery, both uterine artery ligation can be done, and pelvic lymph nodes. Now, regarding the procedure of radical trachelectomy, the patients need to be informed about the complications of surgery, this type of surgery, the risk of premature delivery, including the potential for subfertility, the possibility of abandoning intraoperatively if the resection margin is positive, or the requirement of adjuvant treatment when the final histopathology is worse. Now, abandoning, uh, abandoning of the procedure is performed when there is close or positive resection margin or lymph node metastasis, which revealed paraoperatively by frozen biopsy. In an analysis by Planty et al., 11% of cases resulted in abandoning, the main reason being lymph node metastasis. Now, regarding the procedure of abdominal radical trachelectomy, incision, it uh, low transverse or a vertical incision can be given upon entry into the abdominal cavity and intra-abdominal survey is performed for possible evidence of metastasis. Bi 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 uh, bilateral pelvic lymphadenectomy should be performed and sent for frozen biopsy. If there is no evidence of metastasis, the procedure is started by developing the paravesical and pararectal spaces and the retroperitoneal spaces is opened through the round ligament. Once the ureter and bladder are dissected, the uterine arteries are transected at their origin. Care is taken to avoid injury to the infantipulo pelvic ligament and tubovarial ligaments. After mobilizing the ureter, the parametria and paracolpus are dissected. At this point, the posterior cul-de-sac is incised and the uterosacral ligaments are divided. Finally, clamps are placed on the lower uterine segment at the level of the internal os, followed by transection of the specimen. The vaginal mucosa is sutured to the remaining cervical stump, followed by a prophylactic circlus. This video is taken from uh, SGO surgical education film uh, by Sharian uh, N. Lewin and Nadim R. Abu Rustam. This is the uh, picture of cervical circlase by abdominal root and by vaginal root. Now the surgical outcome. Perioperative complication may occur up to 8.5% of cases. Paraoperative complications are ureteric injury, bladder or vascular injury. Postoperative complications are amenorrhea, dyspareunia, prolonged vaginal bleeding, cervical stenosis, cervical vaginal dehiscence, circlase erosion or pel pelvic lymphocyst. Regarding fertility outcome, 
15% of women may be infertile and may require ART. It is recommended that women should wait six to 12 months following radical trachelectomy before attempting to conceive. Regarding the obstetric outcome, 54% cases may conceive. First trimester abortion is comparable to the healthy population. Second trimester and preterm pre -term birth a little bit higher and term delivery may be uh, achieved in 52% of cases. Regarding the oncologic outcome, recurrence rate is 3 to 6%, mortality rate is 2 to 5%, and 5% of the patient may require adjuvant therapy. The prognostic factors are actually the tumor biology, and mainly the adenosquamous type and LVSI is the most important risk factor. Regarding follow-up, every three to four months, for the first two years after surgery, then every six to 12 months, up to five years, thereafter return to population-based screening. And the follow-up schedule should include HPV testing. Colposcopy along with HPV testing is, is an, another option, but colposcopy and cytology frequently is unsatisfactory. Pelvic MRI six months after surgery and then early for two to three years, other imaging can be done based on symptomatology. Now the obstetric management, consultation with specialist phytomaternal medicine should be taken and delivery should be planned at 38 to 39 weeks by elective cesarean section due to permanent sarclase. Uh, regarding completion hysterectomy, 5% cases may need elective hysterectomy for non-oncologic reasons. And the decision of routine hysterectomy or cesarean hysterectomy once the family is completed should be individualized. Now, the take-home message is the introduction of radical trachelectomy produce a, a, a procedure is a major breakthrough in the management of early stage cervical cancer. It is an acceptable alternative in well-selected cases. The majority of pregnancies will reach the third trimester, and of those, 75% will be delivered at term. Radical trachelectomy should therefore be considered in women of reproductive age while uh, there is a wish to preserve their fertility. Thank you all for patience hearing. Thank you. I think I can talk now. Thank you, Dr. Janathan Firdos for your wonderful talk. Um, I think we heard four uh, presentations basically in this uh, session by Dr. Jitendra, Dr. Professor Sabira Khatun, uh, Dr. Professor Akram, and Professor Jannath. I think Dr. Um, Akram was in hurry. Um, very clear pictures and well-formed uh, presentations. I, I thank you on um, behalf of Suffolk for the presenters, and I think we must take this forward for implementation. Thank you so much. Thank you, madam. Uh, instead of Dr. Nija Bhatla, our next presenter is Dr. Rumi Rai. I humbly request the chairperson of this session to invite our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am uh, Dr. Niranjan Chawan. Hi, all of you. It's nice to be here together. Thank you, Dr. Alia, Dr. Hoana, Dr. Bhagya, and Obstetric Gynec Oncology Society of Bangladesh. It's a pleasure for me to invite Dr. Romi Rai. He is MCH Gynec Oncology resident at the AIMS specialist. The government of Sikkim has done training in Tata Memorial Hospital, Kolkata, and as a member of AGOI, I request him to start his presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, respected organizers and teachers, Today, I will be presenting on behalf of Professor Nirza Batla, ma'am, as she is not well today and has given me the opportunity to present on her behalf. So, the, uh, can you see my slides, sir? Yes, we can see. Yes, Go ahead. So, the topic for my talk is management of rare cancers of cervix. I'm presenting it on behalf of Professor Nirza Batla, who is Professor and Head and Chair of the Division of Gynecology Oncology at Ames, New Delhi. As we all know that as per Global Can 2020, cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer among females and is nine most, most common cause of death due to cancer. 
And WHO in 2020, they came out with new screening, with new classification, WHO classification for 2020. So the major changes in this classification were this common cell carcinoma, it was divided into two categories, which was SPB associated and SPB independent. And in this squamous cell category, the distinction was possible based on morphology, and it was not possible, distinction was not possible based on morphology alone. So we required further testing like P16 and SPB testing. But adenocarcinomas, which was also divided in SPB associated and SPB independent, in this ca category, the distinction was based on morphology alone. And WHO, they omitted serious carcinoma from cervical cancer category. Intermediate adenocarcinoma was a diagnosis of exclusion, and adenocarcinoma NOS was to be used as less as possible. Coming to the glandular lesions of cervix alone, we all know that SPB associated endocervical carcinoma, the most common type is usual type, which is 75%, followed by mucinous type, which is 10%. But the SPB independent endocervical carcinomas consist of only 10 to 15%, out of which gastric adenocarcinoma, clear cell carcinoma, and mesonephric adenocarcinoma consist of this. HPV independent cancers. This is a brief overview of FIGO staging 2018. We all know this. And this is a brief stage overview of stage based management of cervical cancer. We all know that in early stage disease, the treatment is surgery. In advanced disease, the treatment is concurrent chemo radiation. Now, coming to the uh, rare cancers of the cervix, squamous cell carcinoma, it accounts for 80 to 90% of cervical cancers out of which only five to seven per seven percent are HPV independent. In adenocarcinomas, which accounts for 20 to 25 percent of all cervical cancers, 10 to 15 percent are HPV independent. So overall, five percent of all cervical cancers are HPV independent. So the, how do we diagnose these HPV independent tumors? So for diagnosing HPV dependent or independent tumors, we need to do some FDA approved HPV test like hybrid capture, Aptima, OVAS test. And this HPV independent tumors, they will test negative in this testing. We have some ancillary tests. And in this testing, we have P53 immunostating, which HPV independent tumors will stay very highly. But this HPV independent tumors will have decreased expression of P16, P14, and P27, which are the surrogate markers for HPV infection. These SPV independent tumors, they also show higher expression for weak M week one mRNA and lower proliferative activity for P10, P53, and Keras. Now, coming to the outcome of these SPV independent tumors, Lee et al. They did a meta analysis of 17 retrospective studies consisting of 2,800 patients. And it was seen that overall survival was better for SPV associated tumor, as well as disease free survival was better in SPV associated tumors. Another retrospective study of 248 patients where the patient had provided cervical sample before treatment, out of which 108 patients underwent surgery and 140 had undergone chem concurrent chemo radiation. It was seen that 18.5% patient had HPV independent cervical cancer. And here it was seen that HPV negativity was associated with poor disease-free survival when it was compared with HPV associated tumor. Another multicentric retrospective study published in November 2020, in which stage 1B endoscopic adenocarcinomas treated with surgery were included. This also showed that HPV independent status was associated with worse recurrence free survival with hazard ratio of 2.3. So looking after all those studies, we can say that HPV independent tumors are associated with worse oncological outcomes as compared to HPV associated tumor. Till date, there's no specific treatment regimen for HPV independent tumors. We have to treat this HPV independent tumors same as SPV dependent tumors. So further studies need to be done to see the prognosis of the disease, the response assessment, the biomarkers and novel therapeutic agents are to be studied for these SPV independent tumors. Coming to the adenocarcinoma of gastric type of cervix, I have mentioned this specifically because previously this cancer gastric type SPV independent adenocarcinoma was also known as minimally deviation adenocarcinoma or adenoma malignum. But WHO 2020 recommends that not to use the term like adenoma malignum and minimal deviation adenocarcinomas. This is the second most common endocervical adenocarcinoma, which consists of 10 to 15 percent. It is not SPV associated, and this is frequently associated with STK11 germline mutation, which causes pure Zygos syndrome. 
And this as gastric type adenocarcinoma also has shown poor oncological outcomes when just compared with usual type endocervical adenocarcinoma, with five-year overall survival being only 42% compared to 91% of usual type adenocarcinoma. For this cancer also, there's no specific treatment guidance as of now. It has to be treated just like any other HPV-dependent cancers. Now, coming to a very rare kind of cervical cancer, which is neuroendocrine neoplasia of cervix, WHO 2020, they published a two-tier system for neuroendocrine neoplasia of female genital tract, which was high-grade and low-grade. Grade 1 and grade 2 were included in low-grade neuroendocrine tumors, but grade 3 and above and all neuroendocrine carcinomas were included in high-grade. Those included small cell cancers, large cell cancers, and combined cancers. We all know that cervix is the most common site of female genital tract neuroendocrine carcinomas, accounting for less than 2% of our gynae malignancies. And small cell neurocarcinoma is the most common female genital tract neuroendocrine carcinoma. They consist of 1.4% of all cervical cancers, usually associated with HPV infection, especially HPV-18. And the diagnosis can be made based on morphology and ISCs like chromogranini and senatophysis. They are associated with mutations like KRAS, P53, and P3A. The staging is same as per WHO FIGO 2018 staging system. Regarding imaging, on initial diagnosis, SGO and NCCN, they recommend to do a PET scan or CECT of chest, abdomen, and pelvis, as the disease has a higher propensity for distant metastasis on present patient. The brain imaging is not routinely recommended, but it is to be done if there's a liver or lung metastasis or present, patient presents with neurological symptoms. As I already told, it presents usually in advanced stage, lymphatic and distant metastasis are present. It has a very poor prognosis with median OS of only 22 to 25 months. The OS for early stage is 31 to 51%, but, but, but for advanced disease, it decreases to 0 to 7% only. Now, coming to the management of neuroendocrine cancers, this cancer, the, there's a no prospective data on neuroendocrine cancers. The majority of the data has been extrapolated from small cell cancer of the lung. So for early stage cancers of the neuroendocrine of cervix, the treatment is radical hysterectomy with pelvic node dissection with or without parotid node dissection followed by adjuvant therapy in neuroendocrine carcinomas in, even in early stage surgery has to be followed by adjuvant therapy and this adjuvant therapy is mainly cisplatin and atiposide based atiposide based chemo radiation in this chemo radiation we give two cycles of atiposide and cisplatin during rt then followed by two to four cycles of atiposide and cisplatin followed by brachytherapy that is the ideal management, or you can give only five cycles of atiposide based chemotherapy. In advanced stage, there is more than one B3. The treatment is primary chemotherapy. It has also to be based on atiposide based chemotherapy plus bracket therapy, followed by two or two to four additional cycles of additional chemotherapy, which is also atiposide based. Now, NCCN 2022, they say that for a tumor, which for a more than four centimeter tumor with no other local extension, NSCD with adiposite based chemotherapy followed by assessment for interval hysterectomy can be considered, which has to be followed by adjuvant chemoradiation and brachytherapy. This, the, this is the recommendation of SGO for neuroendocrine tumors of gynecological tract. Like I all told you, for early stage, the treatment is hysterectomy followed by adjuvant therapy. And for advanced stage, it is primary chemoradiation followed with primary chemoradiation followed by additional chemotherapy. Now, coming to stage 4B disease, the treatment is chemotherapy alone, which is atiposite based for five to six cycles, and individuals RT and palliative care as per patient, individual patient. In case of recurrent settings, there is no consensus treatment as of now. But for first recurrence, for first recurrence, MD Anderson, they have uh, described a protocol which, in which they use something called Texas cocktail, which is a triple drug chemotherapy regimen which is tepotecan, paclitaxel, and bevacizumab. After the patient has been diagnosed with recurrence, they will advise the patient to undergo PET, CT, molecular testing, brain MRI, and they will start on Texas cocktail, which is topotecan, paclitaxel, and bevacizumab. For multiple recurrence, there's no consensus as of now. Targeted therapy using nevolumab or MEK inhibitors has been tried. Recent study has shown that even neuroendocrine cervix, carcinoma of cervix has a significant part one expression. So in near future, PARP inhibitors may be used for treatment of neuroendocrine carcinomas of cervix. Now coming to primary sarcomas of cervix, 
according to ncdp data of 2020 1.3% of cases had a primary cervical cancer out of which carcinoma sarcoma of the cervix was the most common coming to the uh, overall survival or the prognosis adenocarcinoma of the cervix had the best pro uh, prognosis among all the sarcomas of the cervix Coming to the most common uh, sarcoma of the cervix, that is carcinoma sarcoma of the cervix, it's a rare biphasic malignant neoplasm with less, with less than 0.05% of all cervical malignancies. It may be associated with SBV infection, commonly seen in postmenopausal women. In a meta-analysis done in 2017 for all cervical carcinoma sarcoma, there was 81 cases of cervical carcinoma sarcoma, and majority of them presented in stage 1b. Seeing the when we saw when we saw the two-year overall survival it was seen that two-year survival was better with surgery plus rt compared to primary rt alone or surgery alone so based on this we can say that it is a disease of poor prognosis there's a no specific treatment guidelines as of now for early stage disease the treatment is surgery which is to be followed by adjuvant rt and for locally advanced disease concurrent chemotherapy for metastatic disease systemic chemotherapy Pembrolizumab has been tried in a single case with good result. So more radiation targeted therapy is needed. Coming to the adenosarcoma of the cervix, which is a disease of good prognosis, the, the treatment usually is surgery alone. There's no role for RT or CT as of now. There's no proven benefit of adjuvant treatment in adenosarcoma. Now, rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma of the cervix, as we all know, is the most common soft tissue sarcoma in children. Out of four varieties, embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma is the most common. Frequently seen in lower general tracts in childhood and is associated with the DICER1 mutation and Lee syndrome. The treatment is usually multimodality approach. So primary conservative surgery followed by chemotherapy in early stage. In advanced disease, chemotherapy followed by conservative surgery. Why conservative surgery? Because they usually present in early Whoa. stages. Whoa. In young childhood, young children. Now coming to another rare cervical cancer, which is melanoma of cervix, it's extremely rare to find a primary melanoma of cervix, usually seen in elderly women. Whenever you see a melanoma of cervix, we should always rule out primary from other sites. Usually diagnosed in early stage, but it's a disease of a poor prognosis with a survival of 20 months in stage one. The treatment is radical hysterectomy, followed by pelvic uh, radical hysterectomy and lymphadenectomy. Chemotherapy is ineffective in melanoma cervix. It's relatively irritant resistant, so can only be considered when there's parameter or gross margin inhibitors. Immune checkpoint inhibitors can be tried in this condition. Coming to the lymphoma of cervix, uh, to see a, a primary cervical lymphoma is extremely rare, consisting of only 0.06% of all cervical malignancies. The most common histology being diffuse large cell lymphoma. The five years overall survival is 70.2%, 70 and the treatment is r -top. That is rituximab, cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, vincristine, and prednisone. Surgery has shown to be of no benefit in lymphoma of the cervix. Radiation may be, can be considered for relapsed or for relapsed diseases. Now, just to highlight some, some rare cervical cancers like clear cell adenocarcinoma, which is usually associated with disease exposure. Treatment is same like any other carcinoma sarcomas, adenoid cystic carcinoma. Treatment is usually surgery for adjuvant chemo radiation in cases with high risk features. They have a poor prognosis. Adenoid basal carcinoma, carcinoma and varicose carcinoma, which is slowly growing but locally aggressive tumor. The surgery, radical surgery is the main history of the tumor, uh, of this condition. So to conclude my talk, the rare cancers of cervix, they consist of less than 5% of all cervical cancers. HPP independent cancers are aggressive tumors compared to HPP dependent tumors. And as of now, they are treated same as HPP associated tumors, but the future research needs to be done to see the patient outcomes and differences in treatment between them. For high-grade neuroendocrine cancers of neuroendocrine cancers of the cervix, the multiple modality treatment is the cornerstone, and the chemotherapy has to be based on atipocyte. And for cervical sarcomas, the management is individualized as per histology, stage, and patient factors. Thank you so much. At the end, I'd like to thank Ma'am Professor Nizam Ma and all the organizers for giving me opportunity to present this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Romeo. It was a wonderful presentation, different types of rare cancer, and uh, we wish Nirja a speedy recovery uh, from her uh, COVID. Thank you so much. Uh, we have any uh, next speaker? Can we have the Thank next you. slide, please?
Can you stop your slide sharing, Rumi Roy, Dr. Rumi Roy? Now oh, I hand over the mic to Dr. Uh, Rokia Anwar, ma'am. Can you please introduce her? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Romi, for your excellent presentation. Um, it was given on behalf of Professor Nirja Bhatla, a legend gynecological oncologist. Now, this is the time for Professor Nadim Muddin Ahmed. Thank you very much. May I correct my name, please? This is Nizamuddin yes, Ahmed from Dhaka. Yeah. Uh, very good evening to everybody from SAR countries. I have been asked to talk about palliative care for cancer cervix in Suffolk countries. That was the responsibility given to me. Uh, Thank you very much for showing your interest to hear about and to talk about prevention and alleviation of suffering uh, while approaching cure, which you have been discussing for last couple of hours, or more so when cure is not possible to reduce suffering. That's what palliative is all about. I'm sure my learned colleagues know about it. Uh, though the theme is elimination of one of the deadly diseases of the women in this regional eight countries. Uh, theoretically, this is quite achievable probably, but I'm sure my learned colleagues will very much agree that there's a huge gap between expectation and reality. Uh, you will have to bear with me without any PowerPoint presentation because I don't dare to give you any knowledge, uh, but just to share a few of my ideas with you. Uh, fantastically, I, I have been listening for last couple of hours that what a great achievement has been done in treatment of carcinoma cervix. That is fine. But uh, a reality on the ground shows there's a huge gap between the expectation and reality, which can easily be elaborated if you go through the book known as titles Women's Health, uh, written by Michael Stolberg, one of the great uh, physicians in UK, who had been talking about the tremendous suffering that women used to undergo after Second World War, before Second World War, with the uh, women's malignancy. Now, that situation probably hasn't changed much in the third world, where uh, I won't burden you with lots of data and figures and facts, because all those are there in the cyberspace. But I can just remind you that uh, though we have achieved so much, but uh, it says that there had been 60,000 death in India with carcinoma cervix, about 6,482 in Bangladesh annually in 2018, 823 in Afghanistan, and 1,367 in Nepal, and about uh, 15 in Bhutan and 3,197 from, from Pakistan. Uh, we don't have data from Maldives. Uh, how these patients die, I'm sure you all gynecologists uh, know much better than I witness that in what wretched condition these women really die in lower and middle income country after all the tremendous achievement of the cure-oriented management of cervix, cervical carcinoma has been achieved. Uh, I have a small figure from the Department of Palliative Medicine in our university in Bangladesh. During the 10 years period from 2007 to 2017, uh, there were 2,000 53 female patients out of about 10,000 patients altogether. And 18.9% uh, patients had gynecological malignancy. And uh, of them, 49.6% diagnosed with cervical cancer. 
Now, 85% of them had moderate to severe pain. A majority had loss of appetites and weakness and sleeplessness and swelling and uh, tremendously bad quality of life. I won't take you to the symptom profile of these patients. But just giving you a one simple glimpse that the morphine, the golden drug of choice for pain relief, I have another data of telling you that in Bangladesh, the average morphine per capita morphine use is less than 0.5 milligram, which is around six milligram globally. And I have all these facts, uh, figures of the support countries where everywhere uh, the, the morphine consumption is less than one milligram. What which, which tells us that all these patients who died, majority of them had severe pain with other uh, symptoms, distressing symptoms of suffering, which could easily be relieved before they, they died. In 1960, uh, in 2014, World Health Alliance is called upon its member states to incorporate palliative care into the mainstream healthcare. Nevertheless, in 2021, out of these Suffolk countries, India has the best profile of palliative care. And you know what is that? That is, after 30 years of their journey in palliative care, less than 1% of the patients who need palliative care can avail it. Now, when we talk about these issues, I would refer my learned colleagues to the latest Lancet issue on uh, value of death, which came out only four days ago, which will show us that globally the tremendous difference between expectation and reality. And I would also refer my learned colleagues to the Lancet Commission report in 2000, of 2018 on palliative care, which will tell you why I'm saying all these instead of focusing on the palliative care for cancer cervix patient. Because palliative care for cancer cervix patient cannot come as an individual package except considering the fact that whether that country has got uh, palliative care facilities or not. Uh, there's no slide, I'm sorry, there's a comment on chat box, no slide. No, I haven't prepared slide because I thought that how many slides can I really accommodate in eight minutes time? So I thought that I would try to share a little bit of my feelings. Now, the, all these uh, dark facts uh, gives rise, uh, brings us to a rather lightning area that for last one and a half year, the Southeast Asian regions have started showing interest in palliative care specifically. A number of countries are undertaking situation analysis profile, include Bangladesh, India, Bhutan, and Nepal. Uh, in conclusion, what I would like to say that, can we urge upon you the clinical colleagues in different countries who are very important and influential to consider the recent report by the Institute of Medicine which underscores the perverse financial incentives that deter implementation of humanistic end-of-life care and encourage costly heroics. It may also incur additional suffering. We need to impress this upon our young colleagues also to make appropriate decision in the face of incurability and futility. Prevailing culture must be changed from a death denying attitude towards pro offering proper value to the death and dying. Uh, thank you very much. I will appreciate any question from any audience because I think I haven't taken 10 minutes time yet. So thank you very much.
over to the chairman. Can I ask one question if there is time? Please, please sure. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, as you understand that cervical cancer presents in a very advanced stages. So what do you do for the foul smelling discharge which continues for long, long times because that's uh, mostly a local disease and they don't Absolutely. die with Yes, sir. What Absolutely. Is your... My personal feeling is maintaining as much personal hygiene as possible, number one. Number two, Cleaning the area with metronidazole solution will give you a magic response in many cases. Number three, systemic uh, metronidazole also can be of helpful. But three things, I'll, I'll just remain focused on that foul smelling discharge. One is personal hygiene as much as possible. At the same time, uh, metronidazole uh, wash, metronidazole and systemic metronidazole if needed. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Can I have a question? Please. Uh, how you manage the CPR lymphedema? OK. Because we cannot manage this, this lymphedema. We send Number the patients to palliative care. Yeah. Now, the issue, the problem is this, that palliative care is not a rocket science or a magic. So once the lymphatic drainage has been obstructed and no, none can uh, probably eliminate it, but can be reduced by a number of approaches like massage therapy, like bandaging, even in severe most cases, quite often sometime with a with a drainage procedure. But uh, this is this cannot be totally cured, as you put it. Uh, but lymphedema is quite common with cervical cancer, and we have a lymphedema clinic. So the main issue is whether we are abandoning the patient, saying that nothing can be done about your lymphedema or about your suffering, but at the same time remaining present to tell the patients that we are there, we are trying your best, and at the same time, elevating the leg, massaging, bandaging with pad and bandage, and things like that. There are some high profile instrument also, but I'm not going into that considering our socioeconomic condition on the ground. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure to hear from Dr. Ahmed the palliative care and the efforts which he has been doing. Uh, there were great presentations by our speakers in this session. Uh, on behalf of uh, the organizers, I would like to thank Dr. Sayyid Akram Hussain, Dr. Romi Rai for presentation on rare cancers and before that the radiotherapy for cancer cervix and Dr. Ahmed. Uh, I would like to now hand over the mic to Professor Rukia Anwar to end the session and then we can move ahead to the next session number four. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Niranjan. Um, with uh, this uh, Tresha session, we learned many things because um, this palliative care is very necessary but uh, less addressed. Uh, in our country, most of the time, patient come to us with advanced stage, wow. more than 90%. So uh, we have to take care of this department and we'll try to develop this department in all medical colleges. So with these few words, I'd like to conclude this session. Thank you, organizer, to giving me the scope to be here. Thank you very much. Thanks to the speakers and the uh, chairpersons. Now I hand it over to Faranaha for conducting next session. Thank you, Dr. Farhana Kalam. Uh, this session uh, is the panel discussion, discussion session, which is conducted uh, moderate, uh, moderated by Dr. Rifatara. I request Dr. Rifatara to introduce our uh, respected discussions and uh, to conduct the session. Dr. Rifatara, over to you. Dr. Farhana Ho. Now is the panel discussion session. And before start of the interactive discussion, discussion session, 
I would like to introduce our respected panelists. Dr. Samanthi Premaratne, she is from Sri Lanka. Dr. Niranj, Professor Niranjan Chavan, she is from, he is from India. Uh, Dr. Ugen uh, from Bhutan, Dr. Namkha Dorji from uh, Bhutan, uh, Dr. Kittipal Subedi uh, from Nepal, and Professor Shahana Parvin from Bangladesh. May I share my slide? Share Koro. Face any problem? Okay, I'm trying. Is my slide visible? Yes. Yes, visible. Yes. Okay. Slide is moving. No, no, no. Slide not not moving. Slide show, please. Also. Not. Not moving. Make Bifat, make a slide show. Yes, I try to, I try to move. Okay, I'm stopping sharing and sharing again. Again, I'm doing. I'm doing. Bifat, I'm doing. The plus, send it to my mail. Prefer the Pamik into open core Rakhapni child, let me share Kutabari. Okay, you share it. Whether slide visible now? Yes. Mila, please check whether the slide is moving or not. Yes, yes. Welcome yes. you all to the case presentation and panel discussion session. Next slide. The patient is a widow of 60 years, para six, living six. She attended to a medical college hospital in the southernmost part of Bangladesh with pervasional discharge for one year. She took treatment from local doctors several times, but pervasional discharge was persistent and incre increasing. Next. She gives no history of cervical cancer screening before. At Medical College Hospital, VIA was done this time and report was positive. She was advised for colposcopy. Next. Uh, Dr. Namkha Durji, are you present here? Panelist? Yes, Apu, I am present. Okay. Uh, question for you. For menopausal lady, what method of cervical cancer screening should be advised for primary screening? VIA, PAPS, or HPV DNA test? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the organizers 
and uh, all the members of the Suffolk for including me as one of the panelists in these discussions, though I don't have much knowledge. And I don't think I'm the right person to be included in this panelist, but given the opportunity, I would like to answer the question. So the question is for a menopausal lady, what method of cervical cancer screening should be advised primarily? The option is given by a PAPS or HPV DNA test. So in this case, first thing I would like to tell that in cases of menopausal lady, the uh, TZ zone is not visible. And for the buyer to be an effective screening procedure, transformation zone should be completely seen. So in the postmenopausal lady, there is no option of buyer because most of the time the TZ zone won't be visible. So the other two options we can do are the PEPs or HPV DNA test. Okay, thank you, Dr. And, uh, thank you, Dr. Namka. Thank you. Let us move to the next question. If VIA is positive, as, as for in this menopausal lady, what should be done next as colposcopy may be inadequate for her? Is this question to me? Yes, this question for you. Yeah. If BI is positive, what should be the next? Ne the next as a colposcopy may be inadequate in menopausal lady. So, there are options, even if the uh, colposcopy is positive and if the, uh, if the bio is positive and if the colposcopy is inadequate, other one is you can use the cervical speculum to dilate the endocervix and see. And other one is we can go ahead with the HPV DNA test. And if it comes positive, then we can go for excisional biopsies like LIP. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Professor Shahana Parvin, uh, do you want to supplement supplement anything? Yes, yes, via is positive as because in postmenopausal lady the cervix becomes atrophied. So in that cases, we can add the with the aid or um, by cervical retractor or other things that we may do the either the um, endocervical curatase and the conization. In that cases, if there is the uh, via a positive, we must have to do it. Otherwise, we may. Uh, lost the endocervical because transformation zone is in drawing inside. So we should do the either ECC plus a conization. Yes, at first, uh, when uh, transformation zone is TZ3, we can uh, do endocervical curators for her. Okay, next slide. This patient denied colposcopy. She went to a gynecologist. Endocervical curatage and biopsy from cervical tissue was done. Next slide. Her histopathology report revealed endocervical tissue, dysplastic glands, suggestive of adenocarcinoma, cervical tissue, chronic cervicitis. Next slide, please. She was referred from Peripheral Medical College Hospital to National Institute of Cancer Research and Hospital. Here, all her vitals were normal, no lymphadenopathy. Pelvic examination revealed Cervix looked normal, no obvious growth on cervix, uterus bulky, both parametrium free. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, Professor Niranjan Chavan, are you here? Professor Niranjan Chavan, our respected panelist. Yeah, this thank you. I'm, I'm there. Uh, well, this patient has got a rare type of a cancer, adenocarcinoma. Usually we expect uh, squamous cell carcinoma, but adenocarcinoma is uh, a very difficult, challenging uh, situation for us, what we come across. And we need to uh, confirm by doing a biopsy, which you have already done, and it suggests that there is adenocarcinoma plus. Uh, they are more, <coughs> uh, you know, resistant to uh, radiotherapy, uh, depending upon what the type of cervical staging cancer is there whether the parametrium is involved or not involved. But uh, uh, being a gynae oncosurgeon, I would prefer to go ahead and do a radical hysterectomy on her and uh, send- Sir, her... uh, sir excuse me, sir. Just, uh, I want to know, the, her uh, histopathology report is suggestive of adenocarcinoma, cervix look normal. So should we start treatment as a case of cervical adenocarcinoma or do further evaluation? 
see the issue is that if you see the graph in indian indian scenario uh, it's really uh, not so good situation in our our country i am aware of what is happening in other countries also and the patients are quite from middle class to lower class of course uh, the choice can be given to her also and we can do a conservative type of surgery but with a 60 year old lady post menopausal suggestive of adenocarcinoma it would be better option to remove the uterus and the cervix rather than doing something else thank you very much sir for your answer the next slide please Yes, doctor. I have yes. at yes. National yes. Institute of Cancer Research and Hospital. Our differential diagnosis were endometrial carcinoma or adenocarcinoma of cervix, because this patient came with a report from peripheral uh, hospital, uh, which was suggestive of endocervical adenocarcinoma. There may be possibility of admixture of endometrial tissue. So uh, we uh, wanted to do a further evaluation and her uh, cervix was also normal looking. Uh, transvaginal sonography was done uh, in which endometrial thickness was normal, pelvic MRI done which showed cervix thickened, possibility of carcinoma of cervix with invasion of lower uterine segment and accumulation of fluid in the uterus. Next slide please. Uh, her previous histopathology slide was reviewed with immunohistochemistry. Endocervical tissue was adenocarcinoma this time, and it was moderately differentiated, and cervical tissue was focal area of atypical glandular hyperplasia. Immunohistochemistry for P16 and Vimentin both were negative. We know that P16 is marker for HPV-associated cervical cancer and Vimentin for endometrial carcinoma, but in this patient, both were negative. Next slide, please. Now, there is a question for uh, Dr. Ugen from Bhutan. Dr. Ugen, are you present? Dr. Ugen, please. She's present. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Okay. Uh, now, based on the above mentioned findings, what is her diagnosis? Her, uh, I think she has endometrial cancer stage two because cervix is also involved. Okay. And, we, uh, have, uh, we have report in hand, endocervical tissue, uh, adenocarcinoma, moderately differentiated, and both vimentin and P16 negative. So uh, it may be endocervical adenocarcinoma. The next question is, what may be the causes of HPV negative cervical cancer? Because here P16 is negative. So Do you like to the, this question? They are the rare type of uh, adenocarcinomas like gastric and all these. Okay, madam. Uh, can I ask Professor Niranjan Chavan about the question? Madam. Professor Niranjan Chavan, sir? Yes, yes, uh, madam. Uh, I have already answered that this seems to be, even though a negative uh, cervical HPV uh, testing which you have done, we need to go ahead and do a radical hysterectomy on her. Okay, sir. Next slide, please. At our center, radical hysterectomy with bilateral salpingophorectomy, bilateral pelvic lymph node dissection was done. No obvious growth was found in endocervix or endometrium even after cutting the specimen. Next slide, please. Now, question for Professor Shahana Parvin. Is the above surgical treatment is adequate for her? Paraortic lymph node dissection should be done or not here? Yes, yes, it is already diagnosed. It is SPV both in ISC, both of the P16 and Viventin was negative. But I think it is SPV negative endocervical carcinoma and the endocervical carcinoma. The treatment is the ideal, the radical hysterectomy with bilateral pelvic lymph node dissection. If we think thought that it was the endometrial carcinoma, then there is the issue for the paraortic lymphadenectomy. So I think it is justified this type of treatment. Okay, thank you, madam. Your next question is, 
whether immunohistochemistry should be advised again in surgical specimen to confirm the diagnosis because HPV negative cervical cancer may be false negative or it may be <laughs> diagnosis of non-cervical cancer, particularly endometrial cancer. Yes, there is that in adenocarcinoma, there is the STB in 0.7, uh, 0.3% cases, there may be STB negative adenocarcinoma, 0.7 STB negative carcinoma, cervical carcinoma. And in STB negative cervical carcinoma, there is the main, uh, the carcinoma is a squamous cell carcinoma. And in 25% cases, it may be a adenocarcinoma. So it may be STB negative adenocarcinoma. And in <laughs> you have any doubt, in that cases, we should do the another, the ISC marker, that is the CEA and also the ERPR, we may do that. But I think it is sufficient for us because there are already that there is endometrial thickness normal MRI report that and all this in favor of the vitamin SPB we are in uh, favor of this it is the cervical carcinoma. Okay, thank you, madam. Next slide, please. Final histopathology report after surgery revealed grossly no tumor is discernible in uterus or cervix. On microscopy, it was endocervical adenocarcinoma, moderately differentiated, lower uterine segment involved. Lymphovascular space invasion present. A pelvic lymph node involved on right side. Next slide, please. Immunohistochemistry done. CEA was positive, but P16 and Vimentin were again negative. Next slide, please. Immunohistochemistry for MMR also done. It showed no loss of nuclear expression of MMR protein. That is suggestive of there is no prob probability of Lynch syndrome related endometrial carcinoma. Next slide, please. And now there is a question for uh, Dr. Kittipal Subedi from Nepal. Are you here, please? Yes. He's Dr. here. Yes. Okay. Sir. Yes, okay, sir. Uh, in this patient, histopathology report showed lymphovascular space invasion positive, one lymph node positive. What adjuvant therapy is needed for her? I think uh, she, not, she needs to go for uh, adjuvant chemo, radi chemo radiation. Although it's uh, an inner carcinoma, but since lymph node is positive, uh, she might need further therapy. Yes, sir. Uh, several studies have shown that concurrent chemo radiation, adjuvant concurrent chemo radiation, mm -hmm. in improve the uh, survival of Overall the survival. Yes. Okay, sir. Uh, next question for you. On pelvic MRI, lymph nodes were not enlarged, but on histopathology report, uh, lymph, one lymph node was found involved. Can we correlate these findings with HPV negative adenocarcinoma? Uh, I think I may not exactly answer this question, but uh, to find out lymph nodes, CT, CT scan would be more reliable for finding out lymph node in uh, MRI. Maybe that could have helped to find okay. out the ligaments. Okay, sir. Professor Niranjan Chavan, uh, do you like okay, to answer yes. the question? Professor Niranjan Chavan? Madam, my, there is an issue about my network. Hello, 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 hello. Okay, okay, sir. Oh, audible. You, you, are audible. you can answer the question. Niranjan, you can answer the question. You can hear you. Uh. Anyone in the uh, panelists can answer this question? This is a HPV negative endocervical adenocarcinoma. And uh, usually HPV negative endocervical adenocarcinoma present uh, in advanced stage. Oh, and lymphovascular space invasion is very common. Uh, although MRI revealed no enlarged lymph node, uh, lymph lymphatic micrometastasis was present before the disease was clinically evident in the cervix. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, my last question. This is a question for uh, Dr. Samanthi Premaratne. She is from Sri Lanka. Are you here? Dr. Samanthi Premaratne? Well, she's not, he's not here. Okay, but Professor Shahana Parvin, madam, I am asking this question to you. 
WHO is transitioning to HPV-based screening test from traditional VIA or PAP test. If in this patient, primary screening test was done with HPV DNA test, how should she be counseled after getting negative report? Yes, because it is a SPB, we think it is a SPB negative, the um, cervical carcinoma. In that cases, in SPB negative detection of the cases, we must have to, if patient has the, any symptom, we must have to do the cytology and repeated screening should be done in these cases for primary screening because otherwise we may lose it. And regular screening, patient must have to regular screening and we must have to do this type of either cytology, liquid-based cytology. Okay, madam. Uh, thank you, madam. Uh, Professor Sabira Khatun, uh, do you want to uh, talk something regarding this point? Uh, this is a very important point you mentioned because uh, our uh, primary screening test is higher, which is not suitable for menopausal women. But the menopausal women, uh, when cancer, endocervical cancer or endometrial cancer, both the cancers can be presented by, by excessive vaginal discharge. So this patient complaining of excessive vaginal discharge for a long time, uh, even if the via test, sorry, HPV test is negative, then uh, uh, the patient should be followed up for exclusion of the malignancy. So next thing is to do pap smear. And even if the, she uh, uh, continue the, the symptom, the next thing is to do the endometrial and the cervical curative. Uh, so this patient should not be uh, left for without follow-up. So during follow-up, this uh, patient, um, uh, the, during follow-up and follow-up gap should not be very long. Frequent issue should be followed and until and unless his malignancy is diagnosed. I think if she, without the screening test, if she had any in the cervical curatives and endometrial curatives, the diagnosis of adenocarcinoma of the endocervical uh, uh, and lower uterine segment could be easily diagnosed. Thank you, madam. <laughs> My heartfelt gratitude to all the respected panelists for their active participation and heartiest contribution to make the session attractive. And thank you very much to the learned audience for patience hearing and to be with us. Now, uh, I'm at the end of the session and over to Dr. Farhana Kalam for continue with the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rifatara. And we are at the ending of our session. Now I am waiting uh, to hear survivor voice. I think there will be no survivor voice. I told okay. Okay. Okay, madam. Okay, okay, madam. Now I request. Okay, madam. Now I request Professor Raushanara Begum, madam, to give closing remarks. Professor Raushanara Begum, madam. She is past president OGSB, former head of the department of Sangaini, Holy Family Red Crescent Medical College and Hospital, Dhaka. Madam, please. Yeah, Madam Asen. Madam Asen. Madam now I would like to request Professor Fozia Hussein, Madam, to give vote of thanks and conclude the session. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. And uh, first of all, my sincere thanks to Almighty God for making today's event a grand success. By His blessings and grace, we are able to host this event. Distinguished guests um, of this August gathering, a warm and cherished evening to you. It is my privilege to propose a vote of thanks and acknowledge the contribution of those who worked hard to make this webinar on cervical cancer elimination, not beyond us, a great success. Teachers are the ideals of the younger generation. They affect the heart and they continue to influence us for eternity in the days to come. Honorable Chief Guest, Professor Thio Three, President of GOSP, Professor Ruhana Hatatwa, President of SafeWork, respected Dr. Alia Aziz, the Chairman of 
Oncology Subcommittee of SAFOG, Dr. Bhagulashmi Nayak, and the participants. On behalf of SAFOG Oncology Subcommittee and USP, I extend a warm welcome and I would like to express my gratitude to all the esteemed delegates of this webinar for their presence and contribution. I extend my gratitude to our honorable chairpersons for taking their time from their busy schedule to grace this event. Thank you for inspiring and encouraging us with your words on this special day. A special thanks and gratitude to Professor Bhagu Lakshmi Nayak and Professor Sabra Khatun for organizing a webinar even amidst the pandemic situation. And of course, Professor Ali Aziz. I should mention uh, Professor um, Shireen Akhtar Begum and Professor Bhagu Lakshmi once again for chairing session one, the deep meaning and appreciation of the topics on cervical cancer staging by Dr. Inaya Abdul Rahim and update and imaging of cervical cancer by Dr. Taira Yasmin were excellent. In session two, I would like to express our sincere thanks to chairpersons, Professor Rubina Sohail, past president of SAFOG, Professor Ferdosi Begum, past president of, immediate past president of SAFOG and the present uh, president of Gynecological uh, Obstetric and Gynecological Society of Bangladesh for giving excellent coverage on the topic. Dr. Jitendra Karir covered precisely about diagnosis and treatment of macroinvasive cancer cervix and uh, the steps of radical hysterectomy and radical trachelectomy has been very meticulously and elaborately explained by Professor Sabra Khatun and Professor Janatul Ferdos respectively. In session three, there were advances in adjuvant therapy for cancer cervix, and I would like to express my gratitude to the chairperson, Professor Rokia Anwar and Dr. Nirajan Chavan. We are all inspired by your great works. The current status of radiotherapy for cancer cervix in safer countries was explained by Professor Syed Akram Hussein. We wish to hear more from him, but he had to attend a live television program, so he actually, uh, it was very concise. But in the future, we would like Professor uh, Akram Hussain to be here again. So management of rare cancers of cervix by Dr. Romi Rai was very nicely presented. And of course, uh, the palliative care for cancer cervix in several countries by Professor Nizamuddin Ahmed has been time demanding and has been extensively discussed. The moderators, the bright and brilliant, Dr. Farhana Hawk, Dr. Farhana Kalam, and Dr. Rifat Dara has moderated the scenario sessions brilliantly. And special thanks to the case discussants, discussants Dr. Niranjan Chavan, Dr. Ugain Tashomo, Dr. Namka Dorji, Dr. Kirti Pal Subedi, Professor Shahana Parveen. But I think uh, Dr. Samanti Premaratni uh, was not here at the end. Uh, and I thank them again for their interesting portrayal of the scenarios. A special mention to Professor Roshanara Begum, even though she is not present here, uh, maybe due to some unavoidable circumstances. She is our past president of OGSB, and she has always been the catalyst that, in, that inspired us to do our best and stand as, as a pillar of power. So with deep sense of appreciation, we thank our loving teachers from all the safe folk countries for their untiring efforts. I also want to thank Professor Shahana Parveen, who worked behind the scene to execute this event, and our technical arrangement team. Our sincere gratitude goes out to you for your rock solid support and uh, the encouragement. I must thank the organizing team, volunteers, for working hard for the past few days to make this webinar successful. Our office, office assistant, Morsha Dalam, Entire team of Inceptive Pharmaceuticals and our media partner, Dr. Stevie, I lack words for your participation and for your willingness to complete the tasks beyond your comfort zones. It requires planning and words eye for details. We have been fortunate to be supported by a team of very active and dedicated uh, doctors and employees of our organization who are well versed in their jobs. Thanks to our technical and IT support team members and the media partners once again. So thank you very much. Every special moment ends, and this occasion is no exception. We have worked in the past for elimination of cervical cancer. Today, we will take home the knowledge and then apply it in our professional lives and work together for its elimination in the present and in the future. Dear esteemed dignitaries, 
from home and abroad, you're all sources of inspiration. Let us take life's challenges in a more positive way. Please stay safe and stay tuned for our next program. So this is Fauzia Hussein from Bangladesh uh, saying goodbye. Thank you. Khuda Hafiz. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Alia there, Dr. Alia. Dr. Alia. Probably she left. Okay, okay. So, Alia, I think she has left. Okay, so on behalf so, of the Oncology Committee, Foxy, I take this opportunity to thank all of you from Bangladesh for having taken, taken such a big challenge and having executed it so nicely and so well. So looking forward to many more uh, um, uh, meetings like this. I think the next one will be taken up by Kirtipal. So looking forward to your uh, meeting from Nepal. Webinar, of course, it's a webinar. Nepal, yeah. Next meeting, Nepal. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry that uh, we kept the survivor's voice in our program, but I could. Uh, I am a bit sick, so <laughs> I could not arrange oh, sure, the, sure. this session, the survivor's program. Next time, we can add the survivor's Voice from Bangladesh in the Kirtipal's program. Nepal. In Nepal, we can and add yeah. a survivor's voice from a Bangladeshi survivor. Yes. Okay. Okay, Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Very enriching discussions. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, so I think. Thank uh, you, Bhagaloki. Please, response to my WhatsApp. Uh, oh. Sorry, actually, Dr. Safara, it was too hectic in the last few days. I could not I could not take any response initially on you.